Okay. Oh, well, this is too loud now. Um, welcome, everyone, for this year's final of the AYBT. After three hard-fought rounds, we've seen three teams emerge for the finals. Um, it's Team Georgia, Team Poland, and Team GYPT, um, who will now fight for first place in this final. But before we start introducing the teams, the most important participants of the final, I'd like to um, ask our jury to introduce themselves. We fight quite a large and diverse jury this year, starting with um, Marcus, and I'll give you the microphone. Thank you, I'm Marcus. Um, I'm a physicist at the Technical University of Vienna. I'm honored to be part of this final with three such great teams, and my work is on um, machine learning and uh, strongly correlated material science. So, not that that is relevant here, but... <laughs> yeah, my name is Christian Teichert. I'm a professor in physics here at the University of Leoben. I'm also currently the president of the Austrian Physical Society. Uh, my speciality is scanning probe microscopy. Uh, for measuring nanometer structures. I'm really looking forward for a great uh, termination of this fantastic tournament. Hello everyone, my name is Martin Datzreiter. I studied physics at the Graz University of Technology and ever since I like to participate uh, as Euro at the AYPD and I wish you a great fight. Hi everybody, my name is Daniel Steiner. I studied physics and astronomy at the University of Vienna and I currently uh, did my PhD in theoretical astrophysics. Currently I'm employed as a software engineer and I'm also looking forward to some very interesting fights. Hi everybody, Joseph Sisia, studied in Vienna, Munich, Jülich at the Nuclear Research Center and in Berlin. I had the chance to work with the late Nobel Prize winner Tony Zeilinger. We worked together at the reactor in Vienna. Um, well, I did physics a lot, but I used it in the industry. So may the good teams be the best. We're going to find out. All the best to you and to the jurors. Be justice. Hi, my name is Andrea Scharlach, and I come from Slovenia, from the University of Ljubljana. Um, so what I work, I work at the university like in doing the research in the fields of biophysics and physics edu education research. Um, yeah, I'm just looking forward for these uh, final fights. Okay, hello, my name is Martin Plescia. I work in quantum computer and quantum <coughs> information at the Slovak Academy of Sciences and uh, I lecture in different universities in Slovakia and Czech Republic. And I'm in IYPD since very long time, probably longer than anyone else here, being now the president of the international IYPD, and uh, wish you all of you luck. Okay, my name is Maurizio Musso. I'm a retired professor at the University of Salzburg, professor for experimental physics. I studied uh, physics at the Technical University in Graz, doing first atomic physics, and then in Salzburg, Raman spectroscopy. I was 2021, 2022, also president of the Austrian Physical Society. I wish all the participants uh, good luck and good success. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Iba. Um, I was a former AYPT participant, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD at Graz University of Technology um, in the field of experimental laser spectroscopy. I wish you all good luck and an interesting final. Hi, I'm Jonathan Costa. I am currently still working on my master's in bioprocess engineering. I am a form, twice former participant of the IYPT and now fresh in a jury. I wish all the best to all of the teams and yeah, thank you. And Jonathan is also this year's team leader together with Simon who will make the clock running. So please introduce yourself. Hello everybody, my name is Simon. Um, yeah, as already stated, I am team leader for the Austrian team this year. I'm also a former ANIYPT participant, um, currently still pursuing my bachelor's, which is why I'm not a juror yet, but I um, have the great joy of uh, keeping the clock running, as you said. Thank you, and then we have Felix, who does all of the IT staff, make sure that the grades are correct and in. So please, round of applause for our jurors and 
the uh, assistance. So before we go to the teams, a few words on and from myself. So I'm Paul, I've been former participant many years back. I've then pursued a career in condensed metaphysics where I graduated from my PhD a year ago in the same group as Markus Wallerberger, so we are colleagues. I will be your non-voting chair today, so I'll make sure that we are very strict on time. So there are a few words, please, first. Um, connect your computer at least 30 seconds ahead of time so that we don't lose anything. Um, about one minute prior to your stage ending, I will stand up so that you have visual confirmation that you should wrap things up. And also for the pause, I would ask the team that is reporter in the next round to already connect and set up the things. We'll have a pause of only five minutes. This is quite short, but we want that every team can enjoy the final and then um, get the train back to where they are from. So um, I will be also non-voting, so I'll just make sure that everything runs smoothly. Now let's go to our teams in the first round. We have the reporter team Georgia, opposition team GYPT, and reviewer team Poland. I'd like team Georgia to introduce themselves and then please already connect the laptop. Hello, we are team Georgia. I'm Mariam, this is Katie and Luca, and we are looking forward to this fight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Round of applause for team Georgia. Um, then the opposition will be team GYPT. Hello, we are the team GYPT from Germany. This is Benedikt, uh, Robin and I am Laura. And it's a pleasure to be here and we are looking forward to interesting and fair fights. Ladies and gentlemen, we are representing Things Sounding Club from the Warsaw, from Poland. And together with me, there is Antoni Kujawski and Bartosz Mazurek. My name is Zofia Lemenska. And we are hoping for our fruitful discussions with other teams. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in the first round, we'll see the problem number two, um, droplet microscope. Um, you can tell us once you're ready, and then we'll start. Okay, we can start. Hello, everybody. I'm Luka Chachnashvili, and today I will present to you problem number two, droplet microscope. Uh, problem says that by looking through a single water droplet placed on a glass surface, one can observe that this droplet acts as an imaging system. And my goal is to investigate the magnification and the resolution, resolution of such a lens. Firstly, starts a, a phenomenal explanation that is shown on this slide. Uh, when we look at the water droplet from the side, we will notice that, that, uh, that it has the same shape as plano convex lens. And because the water droplet is transparent, we can freely say that it works like given lens. So it has its own magnification and the resolution. But before mo moving to them, it is crucial for this problem uh, to determine the shape of the droplet. Uh, for this, write that uh, the sum of the atmospheric pressure, uh, the Laplace pressure, and the water pressure equals constant P pressure, because the bottom part of the droplet is at the same level. And according to the young Laplace equation, we can easily calculate delta P. Uh, and uh, including the uh, radiuses of curvature can be calculated with these formulas. And if we insert them in the first uh, equation, uh, we'll get the last formula, in which C is an unknown constant, but that's not a problem. Uh, for this, we can do the following thing. Uh, let's name Z to this parameter. And note that the derivative of the z function is the same as the derivative of the f function. Uh, and we can rewrite the first uh, equation like this and solve it for uh, z function and get it. Uh, and in order to get our desired f function, we have to move z function uh, up so that um, the last point of it becomes zero. And in order to uh, check that my calculations were right, uh, we have uh, solved this equation in Python, and as we see, uh, theoretical result perfectly matches with the experimental shape. Uh, since we have already determined the shape, now it's time for the magnification. And note that uh, we are looking at the uh, image in the central part of the lens. And that's why, uh, why, uh, that's why we can use the approximation, 
uh, that the um, upper part of the lens is spherical. And uh, it has a radius of curvature, uh, following radius of curvature. And um, the second derivative of the z equals following from the first equation. And uh, we will get the last formula for the radius of curvature. Uh, and uh, we can write the magnification theory uh, for the spherical lens with the same radius of curvature. Uh, so, uh, when the object is placed uh, at a distance p from the lens, uh, we will get the, um, uh, we will get the, uh, sorry. So, uh, when the object is placed at a distance p from the lens, uh, we'll get the image at a distance q. And uh, with the help of lens equation, we can easily calculate q, uh, which depends on the focal length. And the focal length can be calculated with this formula. But as I already mentioned, the droplet is plano convex lens, and therefore one of the radius is as large as infinity. And in our case, these members are zero. Uh, and for magnification, we can use the following formula. Uh, and if we insert all the, param all the parameters we have already calculated in it, we get the last formula for the magnification. But uh, it's important to say that at the time, we use the approximation that all the refracted rays intersect in one point. But in reality, as they intersect in different points because of the phenomenon that is called spherical aberration. And this phenomenon has a very huge impact on the resolution. Because of it, an image of a point light source is not a point, and has a certain size. And if we place the sensor where the image has a minimal size, we'll get the following image um, on the sensor. But note that uh, this image is gotten when we have only one light source. But according to the definition of the resolution, we have to find out what's the minimal distance between two light sources, uh, the images of which can be distinguished from each other. And at the time, uh, we'll get the following image on the sensor with two white circles that with the diameters of d and the uh, distance between the sensors d also. And this means that if we get uh, this um, uh, image at a uh, distance x from the lens, then the resolution, the same as the angular resolution, can be calculated with this formula. And in order to theoretically calculate d distance, we have to uh, write the equation of the uh, refracted ray and find the point of the intersection with the sensor. And uh, firstly, uh, write the equation of the first ray and find the, uh, find the coordinates of the point A. Then move to the refracted ray. And um, for this, we need a uh, vector form of Snell's law, Snell law uh, which enables us to easily calculate um, uh, the components of the T uh, refracted vector uh, with the help of N normal vector and the I incident vector. Uh, and uh, with these components, we are able to write the equation of the T-ray and um, find the coordinates of the point B. And as we see, x coordinate of the point B depends on the alpha, alpha which is a contact angle between a certain liquid and the surface. And with the same method, uh, we, can, um, uh, we can write the equation of the ray R and um, uh, find the coordinates of the point C, uh, which depends on the width of the glass. And lastly, with the same, uh, absolutely same method, we will get the equation of the ray V. And according to, this, uh, according to all these equations, we have created a simulation in Python. Um, and with the help of a thousand rays, now we are um, easily able to calculate the minimal, uh, image size, uh, minimal image size. Now let's move to the experimental part. Uh, firstly, I will introduce my experimental setup. Uh, in order to uh, get more precise results and um, instead of hand, I have used um, a 3D printed mechanism with hydraulic system uh, to gently place the water droplets on the surface of glass. And except this, um, I have used a similar mechanism to control the distance between the uh, object and the glass. Um, and uh, I have used uh, graph wafer as an object and camera also. And as experimental programs, I have used tracker for measurements, Excel for data analysis, and Wolfram and Jupyter for uh, solving the equations. Now it's time for the results. This graph shows how the magnification uh, depends on the distance between the object and the droplet uh, for each uh, size of the droplet. 
and uh, pay attention that uh, this, all of these four graphs are for a certain uh, contact angle, uh, which is, um, in this case, approximately 40.4 40 40 degrees. Uh, I can say the same thing uh, on this slide, but for different uh, contact angle, as well as on, the, on this slide. But uh, probably you have already noted that I have third color error uh, in my, on my graphs. And now I will talk about how I have calculated it. Um, as we see, uh, there is a p parameter in the magnification formula. Um, and p parameter is the distance between the object and the lens. And uh, since we have used approximations that the upper part of the lens is spherical, uh, this p parameter can uh, include this delta p, uh, delta p width of the uh, water medium, and therefore changes p parameter, and change in p parameter changes the magnification, as uh, seen from the slide. Uh, and according to this, uh, theoretical error is calculated. Uh, and for better understanding, uh, this graph shows how the magnification depends on the droplet size uh, for each contact angle. And as we see, uh, the magnification and the droplet size are inversely, inversely proportional quantities. That's because uh, when we increase the uh, droplet size, uh, the radius of curvature also increases, and this causes um, lower magnification. Uh, we have talked about the magnification, and now it's time for the resolution, but before moving to the results, I have uh, to introduce you the setup which I used for measuring the resolution. There is not much difference, but uh, instead of uh, uh, camera, I have used the image sensor because the camera has lens in it, and um, which, has, uh, which has its own aberrations, and this makes you also huge errors. Um, and uh, as, um, uh, well, as a light source, I have used a smartphone screen, which was placed very far away from the sensor, uh, and it displays the following image of a white dot. And uh, here are the results for the angular resolution um, and um, how it depends on the droplet size. And as we see, uh, there is pretty good match between uh, theory and experiment. Um, now, uh, for other details, um, it, uh, uh, the magnification of the, uh, magnification of the lens of the droplet also changes near the edges. And I also investigated this, and as we see, um, as if the point is uh, far away from the center of the droplet, uh, it is uh, more magnified because uh, the radius of curvature is different from in the uh, edges. Uh, and um, uh, I, ha I was also interested, interested if the wavelengths had any effect on the resolution. And as we see, uh, it very, very slightly changes the resolution because uh, the change in index of refraction is not very high. Uh, and I uh, change also the glass thickness, and as we see, it um, affects the resolution. Uh, the thicker the glass, the lower the resolution is. Um, I have also changed the state of the droplet, and probably you have interested what I mean in the state. Uh, I mean, um, what, uh, which part of the lens does a, a light rays fall first, uh, convex or flat, as seen uh, on the figure. And as we see, it also changes the, uh, uh, changes the slightly changes the resolution. Uh, except the uh, spherical aberration, the resolution of the lens is affected by the diffraction. And at the time, uh, the resolution can be calculated with the following formula. But if we compare, if we compare results uh, given, um, uh, gotten from this formula and the previous formula for, um, uh, for the spherical aberration, we would notice that the spherical aberration has much more uh, impact on the resolution than the diffraction. Now, uh, to, sum up, uh, to sum up our research, uh, we have concluded that the important parameters from the theoretical part are distance between the droplet and the object, also radius of the droplet, uh, thickness of the glass and contact angle, and from the experimental part, we have concluded that wavelengths very slightly change the angular resolution, also size of the droplet is important for the uh, magnification and resolution, uh, state of the droplet act, uh, in, um, has the impact uh, on the resolution uh, as well. And uh, distance from the center, uh, the nearer the point to, um, to the center, the more, magni more magnified it is. Uh, these are the references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. We now have two minutes for questions from the opponent. And I'd please ask the opponent to stand up. Hello, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, as for some uh, clarifying questions, 
Um, first of all, in your experiments, did you consider evaporation? Uh, um, is, uh, evaporation in my experiments was um, was negligible because um, I have observed um, how much tight, uh, how much time does the smallest uh, smallest droplet need to evaporate, and it was about um, uh, 25 to 20 minutes, and I need less than a minute to conduct the whole experiment. You so were, are you talking about the whole evaporation of the smallest droplet? Yes, but. but do you think the shape changes? Yes, but um, as I already said, it needs 20 minutes and I need uh, less than okay. a minute to uh, complete um, the experiment. Thank you very much. Um, on a technical level, uh, how do you uh, define a resolution? So what were the uh, technically uh, technical threshold in order to... Uh, oh. Okay, uh, firstly, uh, from the simulation which we have created in, uh, uh, in Python, uh, we have, uh, yes, uh, we have measured um, uh, the minimal uh, size, of the, uh, size of the image and uh, then divide it to the uh, distance between this image no, I, and the uh, I, I'm length. sorry, I, I meant uh, in your experiments when you had an image of the two oh. um, light yes, sources, yes. what uh, technical uh, Why do you distinguish those two? Yes, uh, I measured the, the diameter of this um, of this white dot, and then divide to the distance between the um, droplet and this um, uh, image. And okay. this is angular resolution. Um, what uh, do you think that this uh, light is uh, sensible? Um, this wavelength. Very briefly, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's maybe move it to the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've now three minutes of preparation of the opponent. Okay, okay. please start. I will be starting with my um, opposition on the droplet microscope. Um, thank you very much again for this very insightful presentation. Um, First of all, in general about your report, you had a very comprehensive basic explanation. I think the support via animation really helped the understanding also in the later derivation, um, just in order to uh, know uh, uh, about what parameters and points you were talking about. Um, and you showed a very deep and uh, theoretical understanding of the underlying physics. Um, just in order for clarification for later experiments, uh, it would have been very interesting to just see a parameter slide where you state all of the uh, important parameters in order then to compare uh, whether you have investigated them all um, experimentally. Um, Moving on to the experiment, we thought that you had a very sophisticated setup, especially this uh, custom-made um, setup uh, leaves the option to be um, very distinct in um, your parameters. Uh, however, it was not clear uh, how you, um, in the beginning how you measured the um, droplet of your uh, the shape of your droplet. Just in the beginning, when you compared it to the uh, shape uh, to the theoretical model of the shape, and um, as well as that there were no no errors, so there were some informations missing there, as well as um, other independent measurements that were not really described, such as, in general, the uh, contact angle to the uh, underlying glass, um, as well as um, the refraction of the glass itself um, that you included in your theory. And um, you had, a, when comparing this with your theory, I will get uh, into soon. Um, the, the, the theory um, in some graphs consistently over predicted what you showed and um, as you uh, stated in some of the um, slides uh, that this is possible due to some of the assumptions but uh, maybe later in the discussion we can talk about uh, how whether, um, the assumptions are justified and whether um, some of the assumptions can be um, uh, resolved in order to just uh, completely model it. Um, then in points of your theory, you had a very nice derivation of the uh, shape of the droplet with the, um, uh, this approach of the uh, different pressures and um, we thought this very sensible. Um, and then uh, the digital um, ray tracing as the theory, th we think this is the uh, most appropriate um, 
approach, and then you had this assumption of the uh, spherical shape above. Um, I want to talk about whether this can um, actually be done or whether uh, the um, initial uh, function that you had derived could be uh, used as well in order to um, determine <coughs> as an, uh, to have it as an input in your theory. And um, then is some initial conditions were not fully accounted for, like this evaporation. You already said that um, uh, you observed the evaporation of a whole droplet. However, I think that um, just a minor evaporation can already change the shape of the droplet due to a possible evaporation hysteresis. Um, we can as well uh, talk about this um, in the discussions. And now I would like to um, invite you up to the stage in order to discuss. Okay. Uh, in your presentation, you have mentioned that uh, it was unclear for you how I experimentally measured the shape of the droplet. I quickly show you that it does not need much time. Yeah. I will take away my laptop. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, as you... Uh, as you see uh, from on the slide, uh, I have used tracker uh, for uh, determining for determining the shape of the droplet. I have marked, uh, as you can see, nine points, and then uh, uh, write uh, write down their coordinates, and that's why uh, I have, and that's how I have inserted them in uh, uh, in the simulation, which I have showed you before. Um, okay. And uh, while placing the drop, um, on what did you look like? Um, the, the task specifically states, like, placing the drop. Uh, did you have, like, any way to ensure that your um, theoretical model always align with this process of placing the drop? Uh. Um, like, regarding the radius. Could the radius have changed by, uh, through dropping height or... Um. Uh, maybe it uh, will have, uh, yeah, so you're asking uh, dropping height, but in my experiments I have remained the dropping height the same. Uh, it was very well controlled, and uh, dropping height, yes, maybe uh, change uh, mm -hmm. the size of the droplet and shape uh, itself. Um, then in your theory, you um, decided, you, you had this approximation of a s spherical yes. shape uh, above. Yes. And you stated that due to that, there is some error at the uh, edge regions of the region you assumed uh, to be. Not error, there is a different magnification near the edges because, uh, as, uh, uh, because near the edges there is a different, um, in different radius of curvature and different radius of curvature means different magnification. Um, and uh, you, I mean, how exactly did you compensate for it, you put in like a range of magnification from what I understood. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I don't understand. Um, when, when compensating for this um, different magnification. Oh, uh, oh, how I calculate the magnification uh, near the edges? You're asking me this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, it is in my turn. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, these are the radiuses of curvature, and uh, using uh, this radius, uh, this formula, uh, we can determine uh, the radius of curvature at every point of the droplet. Uh, so yes. how it changes, uh, how it changes um, uh, near the edges. And um, I have uh, created a graph which showed uh, how the radius of curvature depends on the small air, and therefore um, I have, and after that I have inserted uh, a radius of curvature near the edges, uh, near yeah, in different points. For example, if this point is air one, it has a special, um, it has different radius of curvature, and for in this case, p point has different uh, radius of curvature, and I have inserted uh, this radius of curvature in the magnification formula, uh, and uh, get the uh, get the final result. Yes, but yeah, yeah. as a first step, you considered like this R1 to be a constant curvature around one part. 
of the droplet. Yes, air one is a radius of curvature, yes. And um, could you have worked without it, it, but just by determining every position of the point along the droplet? Sorry? You, you seem to have a graph for the shape of the droplet yes. without the assumption that there is a constant curvature. Oh. And since you did your analysis with ray tracing, yes. couldn't you have just inputted this function yeah, it into will be absolutely the same because the spherical approximation is very, very good. So the first approxima approximation is a line with the first derivative and the second approximation is a sphere with the second okay, derivative. Okay, you, you say this, this approximation is very, very good, but then when you go to your experiments, you... Um, so it's pretty good match. If, if you go to the experiments... Yes. Um, There you put in this tunnel of theory. Yeah, here. Yeah. Yes, going Which through, going, going further. Further? Yeah. Um, here, one back, yeah. So what was then the exact um, uh, justification in order to, to put around this uh, tunnel of error in your next um, experimental slide? Oh, uh, yes. Since we use the uh, spherical approximation, um, it um, would give us uh, some uh, theoretical error because this delta p width of the water medium, which can be uh, taken into consideration into this p parameter. The p parameter is the distance between the spherical lens and the droplet, uh, sorry, uh, object. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in how I, me uh, how I measure this delta p... Um, yes, I would. Yes, here. Yeah. Uh, for example, this is a droplet. Uh, and uh, since um, I have theoretically uh, calculated the radius of curvature of the top, uh, top part, Yes. Uh, I have uh, I uh, created uh, I create uh, um, uh, the um, circle uh, circle in tracker with the same radius uh, same radius I get from theory and then fit it to this droplet and uh, find the last points where it touch the droplet and after that I am uh, measuring this delta p length as shown on this uh, uh, photo. Okay. Um. I see. Then um, going to the uh, point I made uh, before, you had, um, in order to determine your um, uh, resolution, you try to, you put down two um, light sources on yes. a phone? No. Uh, on a phone, I have only one light source with a very small diameter, a very small, very small light mm -hmm. source. Only one. Yeah, uh, no, I mean regarding the two light sources. What kind of light sources were they? Um, it, uh, I, I try to be uh, the lighter, I try to be um, these light sources as small as possible because I wanted them to be uh, like points okay, light sources. Okay, um, have you measured the um, emission range of, this, of these light sources? Which wavelength they emit? Which wavelength? Wavelength. I, yes. The color of the. And how it depends on the resolution? Or yeah, have you investigated that? Yes, of course. Okay. It uh, really does not change uh, because uh, there is very small, very small change in index of refraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you see, uh, there is. Uh, okay, and uh, I I see a. Uh, consistent minor over prediction. What is the reason? To what do you mean? That. Like, um, you have a theory plot there, and yes. below you have experimental points, yes. and they clearly don't match. Like, it's a consistent uh, I over prediction. I think it's pretty good match. Uh, like, from the tendency, I totally agree. And I mean, it's, it's uh, quite zoomed in, but how do you come to this measurement accuracy if you look at your error bars? Yes. If they were just a bit bigger, you could say that it's within your error, but you uh, claim that your accuracy is very, very high just yes. to overpredict with your theory. So, I don't understand what are you asking. Okay. Um, what is the reason for the theory not to be within the error of your data points? Uh, maybe some... Uh, uh, 
uh, maybe because um, the some uh, in some parts um, uh, a sensor uh, can't detect light rays. Okay, so you say it's a measurement error. You say it's a measurement error. Why isn't it in the error bar of your measurement point? Uh, maybe uh, you know. Uh, I that's a maximal that's a possible error I could get uh, with the uh, with the measurements uh, and uh, maybe um, uh, I sometime maybe. Um, this uh, the third does not match with the experiment because. Um, uh, okay, I, I just is, think the index you. Index error is slightly different because. Okay, I, I think you should just be clearer about your error and then um, maybe you will have just a much better agreement. Um, moving on. Yeah, I think uh, my time is up and I don't have enough time for uh, another question. Thank you very much for um, this interesting discussion and I will come to my um, uh, conclusion now. Seems to be some technical problems. Okay, I, I'll take this as reference. Um, well, okay, at first we talked about uh, the shape as the droplet and how um, this was actually determined in an independent measurement and uh, I think that was done very well. Um, and then we talked about the theory and the um, compensation of uh, some errors in uh, the magnification and there, there uh, was made uh, this assumption of a constant um, a curvature um, where I am still not sure why he didn't just uh, put in the function that he uh, determined um, at the start for the shape of the droplet. Um, and then we talked about uh, the light source, uh, which I think he uh, investigated uh, well with considering the uh, resolution. However, um, I think he could have been just a bit clearer on her errors. Uh, since the uh, deviation is not big. Thank you very much. Um, this was my part. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize for the, for the clock. We'll get this running shortly. We now have uh, three minutes for questions of the reviewer. I will stop time and then let you know when you have 30 seconds left. OK, a first question to the reporter. How do you change uh, the contact angle of your droplet? I simply by changing the glass itself. Okay, uh, question to the opponent. Uh, do you think that uh, aberration uh, of our droplet have impact on that problem? Um, it really depends on how he measured. And I think uh, I'm not sure about it, but he should just investigate how the shape changes, not only how long it takes for the drop to Okay, a, uh, uh, and question to the reporter. Uh, do you b observe uh, aberration of droplet uh, when you do a measurements? Yes, um, uh, the whole thing we are doing is observing the aberration. We and are measuring. Uh, we do are you measuring think the uh, then K have impact on accurate of your measurements? Sorry, uh, do you think that aberration have impact on accurate of your measurements? Uh, so aberration is uh, the resolution is limited to the aberration, and the, yes, of course it has impact because okay. resolution is caused by the aberration. Okay, uh, do you measure the shape of your droplet for, for example, different contact angle, or you did? Yes, do yes, yes, for every droplet I had. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, but on the presentation, there was only one measurement for all the droplet shape. Uh, because, yes, because uh, I have used uh, 16 droplets and uh, I wasn't okay. able to. Okay, put uh, thank you. And do you think that uh, your theory uh, will be accurate for really low or really high contact angle of droplet? Uh, yes, yes, it will be. Okay. Uh, question to the opponent: uh, Do you think, do you believe there is a limit of the magnification that the droplet can achieve? Um, yeah, I think there are uh, certain limits. Um, just uh, because the process is not scalable, uh, because surface tension is not scalable. Okay, uh, question to the reporter. Uh, did, you, uh, did you do an experiment with different destiny of the liquids of the droplet? Sorry. Uh, do, do, you, do you do measurements for different density of your droplet? Density? Yes. No, not the density. Okay. Because the uh, problem was about the water. 
Mm, okay. Uh, uh, and what happens if uh, your droplet will be very big? That uh, we will will obser still observe the magnification. Uh, it will be so low that it will be near one. Mm. It will, in case of very big, very big droplets. Uh, and you, did, did you observe by doing your measurement hysteresis of uh, contact angle? Uh, chain, um, hysteresis con of contact angle. Uh, you know, I, I have not investigated the uh, hysteresis of contact angle, but uh, it was uh, I have measured every time I have okay. measured the contact angle in every my experiments. Thank, uh, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I have two minutes for preparation of the reviewer. Okay, I think we can start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Antonio Kujawski. I represent Phoenix Science Club, and I will present you our, our review to problem number two, droplet microscope. Going to the pros of the reporter, uh, we got a very good theoretical model for uh, the droplet shape, the magnification and the resolution. Uh, that's what, what, it, what was in the problem content. Uh, we got a lot of measurements uh, made for a different contact angle, uh, for a different value of our droplets, and it was really great. And uh, we got a very good exp experimental setup, which allowed us, which allowed uh, the reporter to do uh, uh, very precise measurements. And uh, he found a very good way to measure our resolution and uh, compress uh, measure. But uh, in our opinion, uh, he, does, he didn't consider a real curvature of droplet, and it, then we don't see a lot of uh, uh, measurements for droplet shape, for example, for different contact angle. And uh, in the presentation, it wasn't clear how he changed a contact angle of this droplet. And in our opinion, it uh, will be better if we uh, change contact angle for uh, uh, different value, like it was really close. It was for uh, 40 to 50 uh, degrees. And he didn't investigate uh, boundaries of his theory. Uh, we don't. We didn't hear it about aberration of our droplet in the presentation, and uh, he didn't show measurements uh, for important parameters uh, such as thickness of glass, uh, which he said that he uh, made. Uh, going to the opponent, uh, he mentioned that uh, presenter didn't measure the aberration and uh, that he didn't investigate how uh, the evaporation of our droplet can affect on the phenomenon, which in our opinion is a very good point. Be uh, and mentioned that uh, the theoretical prediction for the shape was uh, not accurate, and in our opinion that approximation which a reportant made uh, was uh, not good enough. And mention importance of uh, way length, which is our opinion, uh, it's important too. But in discussion, uh, he didn't discuss a lot of our chromatic aberration and uh, put too much time to the error bar topic, which we think that in the discussion there could be uh, more topic that was in the presentation. Uh, and also, he didn't mention that. Uh, reporters uh, could have checked the theory for higher range of contact angle, which in our opinion is uh, uh, it's something that uh, uh, will be uh, that make the problem that changing the uh, contact angle uh, for the higher value uh, will be really uh, useful to know that our theory uh, work at all and in discussion. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, debates of uh, that uh, how the uh, shape of our droplet uh, have impact on our uh, problem, uh, which is, in our opinion, uh, one of uh, one of main the which was uh, in our opinion the shape of the droplet is one of the main uh, topics in this problem, and it in our opinion it. Uh, this debate was uh, pretty good, and uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
now have two minutes for cl closing remarks of the reporter. Um, uh, is very good because it's known fact that the uh, first approximation is with a line uh, as the first derivative, and uh, the second uh, approximation is with a uh, fair with the second derivative, uh, and um, it is also very good because um, we are looking the image in the central part of the uh, central part of the uh, droplet. Um, and um, uh, Maria mentioned also the chromatic aberration, uh, but uh, I think it's a pretty known fact that the chrom chromatic aberration uh, does not affect the uh, size of the, um, the size of the um, uh, image, minimal size of the image. And except this, um, in my experiments, chromatic aberration uh, was not uh, was not seen. Um, and um, uh, one of the topics, uh, one of the um, weaknesses of my report as the opponent said was I have not uh, said how I measured the contact angle. Uh, and uh, simply, um, I have marked uh, the two nearest points uh, here, draw a line uh, and uh, find uh, this uh, angle. This was a uh, way to, um, way to uh, calculate the contact angle. Uh, and also, uh, with one of the discussion, one of the discussion topics here is the uh, magnification near the edges. I have explained, uh, I have explained it, but um, I want to mention several, uh, one more thing that except the different radius of, except the different radius of curvature uh, in this point, for example, uh, the lens uh, is um, rotated at a certain angle. And I have also, I have taken this, taken, uh, you know, I have also taken this into consideration in my theory. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have five minutes for questions from the jury and I would like to ask opponent and reviewer please to stand up and like share a microphone first. Martin. A very quick question on slide 20. Yes. Um, just a moment please. So what's the reason for the, uh, for the light to make the turn in the point C? Uh, sorry, I, I can't... I like the, the, black, the black arrows, I believe this is light. And on, yes. in the point C, it, it makes a, a sharp turn to the right. Yes. And I don't understand why. Uh, it simply is a snow slope. Uh, but it, it looks like it, it goes like a reflection from B to C and from C to D doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, maybe uh, in uh, this uh, figure it's not clearly seen, uh, uh, but actually uh, the final R1 is that uh, the final uh, refracted ray comes like this. And maybe in this small W width it is not clearly seen. Uh, the, uh, the incident angle of the ray R is not clearly seen and that uh, maybe uh, you um, maybe cause some um, uh, of course, some... Uh, okay, yes. thank you very much. We have another question from Josef. Questions to the reviewer um, on the reporter. You asked uh, for a huge droplet. In physics, we measure, 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 measure again. So what is huge, what is small? Where is the boundary? Uh, you mean uh, what's happened for small droplets? Yeah, what do you imagine huge? Is this one square millimeter, two ah. millimeters, 100 kilometers? I mean, it's like droplet uh, about a few centimeters, uh, uh, like uh, bigger than it uh, was in the measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other further questions from the jury? Martin. Yes, one question to the reporter, please. Uh, could you quickly restate the, the reason for the spherical approximation uh, of the surface? Uh, yes, uh, the reason uh, why you have your spherical approximation is that, is that uh, we are looking the image in the central, uh, central part of the droplet, and uh, uh, we can, uh, it's a pretty known fact that uh, every uh, a uh, surface can be approximated to the spherical uh, with the, um, it's the uh, same as the as first 
sorry, uh, the, sh um, the, the shape can be approximated as a line, which is a uh, first derivative, and the, uh, with a uh, second derivative, uh, it's uh, similar to the spherical approximation. And um, uh, yeah, uh, that's the main reason uh, which I stated that uh, spherical approximation is good uh, and um, good uh, in this problem. Um, and um, it also cl was clearly seen from the uh, comparison between theory and experiments that okay. uh, it was. Thank good. you. Um, I think question, Marcus. question to the opponent. What had happened, assume that the reporter messed up cleaning the surface properly. What would happen then? Um, like uh, if there's like residue of some kind, uh, the surface properties change, um, so therefore, um, and uh, the image properties change, like how much uh, light gets through that can impact the uh, resolution, as well as uh, the contact angle on the surface. Thank you. Another quick question, 34, slide 34. Yes. Yeah. yeah, in the top right, uh, like the, the experimental data seem to be like kind of reasonable, but in the theory, we, we see this maximum at, at the droplet size yes, six. Um, so is there a clear reason why for, why for this angle there is a maximum and for the other angles it's monotonical? Uh, yes, um, the main uh, reason is that uh, probably you have questioned why I have uh, dots uh, instead of line in the theory. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, I yes I have to because of the change in contact angle every time in every experiment I have to measure the contact angle and insert in the theoretical formula and uh, that's why I have dots and um, uh, it uh, also um, uh, it also affects the uh, uh, resolution as well because every time okay. I had to measure the uh, contact angle uh, to get more precise result. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're out of time and we'll proceed to grading. Perfect. So um, in the finals, we do not keep. No, no. So, so we'll not reveal the grades to make it more interesting for then the um, closing ceremony to see who has won. But we're going to still ask for jurors to kind of like justify lowest, highest grade. So please justify it without explicitly saying which grade you had. Um, and for the review, I'd like to first ask Andrea to give a short comment. So first, congratulations for the work you've done. Um, I liked some parts of your report. I mean, um, you showed um, that you, um, you were thinking about a lot of things. Uh, you presented um, a huge amount of this theoretical description. Um, you showed some, um, so your experimental setup was quite um, um, detailed and so on. Um, but there were also some, um, some aspects that were, um, that could be improved. I missed some more of this qualitative description, um, so the part of the theory was quite long and hard to follow, and there were no explicit qualitative um, description of what is the takeaway message of this whole theory. Um, and I was expecting some more uh, from the discussion. Um, I thought it was not really vivid, I mean, uh, not giving really explicit uh, answers or, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then on the higher end was Jonathan. Okay, so I in general feel like you um, completed the problem statement in like uh, a very good way. Like I feel like what the problem asked of you, you did. I agree with most parts of uh, my colleague. I suppose, uh, I don't know how far we are away from each other, but in general, I also feel like the discussion, like during the discussion you proved that you did even more than you showed and that you had a, a generally a very good understanding of what, you, what you're talking about. 
Thank you. Then for the opposition, we have a lower end Alex. Um, yes, I think you did a good job during the presentation and also the discussion. I think the questions in the beginning could have been a bit more precise and a bit more focused on what exactly went on in the presentation. Um, generally, I like that you brought up some interesting points, um, but then there were also points where I felt like these could have been kept a bit shorter and on the other side, other things could have been prioritized a bit better. I don't, but I think still uh, the discussion was interesting to follow and you had the main points in the speech as well. Thank you. And then for um, the higher end, we had Josef. Yeah, opponent higher end. Um, it's quite a, quite an excellent discussion. This is what I understand as a discussion. You didn't overrule somebody. You had a nice discussion, excellent discussion. You came on to the theoretical knowledge, etc. So, and all these other points you gave. So you, you gave us an indication that you understood what's going on. And this is, and use the time. Thank you. Thank you. Then for review, we had Loa and Martin. Uh, okay, uh, so basically, uh, yeah, first of all, it was not a bad review or anything like that, and when I looked left and right, I was pretty much there. Uh, I had the feeling you, you took a role of another opponent, so you, you opened from, from my perspective, rather than really focusing on what was done and what was discussed and what was presented, you opened too many like new topics, and, and some of them were not that relevant, like, like having a huge... Uh, Droplet, like droplet, is something small in some sense, and like like pushing on like what would happen if we if we go to to large droplet or like with the chromatic aberration. We have seen the photographs of the white light. It was it was still white. We didn't see any like rainbow there. So apparently he didn't have any large issues with like like different colors behaving differently. So opening you know like another topic from the position of the reviewer. I don't think it's it's appropriate. So so I, they, there were a couple of things I liked, but I have to criticize <laughs> here. So so these were basically the the topics I disliked on on that. Thank you. And then we have Christian. Hi, Mark. Yeah. So I think you did a very good evaluation of a very good fight, and with exception of the huge droplet, I think that you raised up really good questions um, in the beginning, and then in. Your report, uh, I, I had the impression that you also pointed out to some uh, overseen points. So. Thank you very much. So then one a warm round of applause for our finalists. <laughs> and we'll have a very short break of five minutes and I'd like to ask everyone to be back here sharp. Okay, everyone, um, thanks for being, being on time. We have now the second stage of this year's A1PT final, where the team of G1PT will be presenting number four rubber band. We have the team of Poland opposing and the team of Georgia reviewing, if that is correct, perfect. Then I think without further ado, um, we can start, just tell us once you're ready. So, hello everyone and welcome to my solutions about this year's problem number four, the shooting rubber band. I'm Benedict Baum from the team GYPT. So, at first, let's have a look at the task. The task said that a rubber band may fly a longer distance if it's non-uniformly uh, uh, stretched uh, when shot, giving it spin. Optimize the distance that a rubber band with spin can reach. So, the important keywords that we have a rubber band, which is non-uniformly stretched, and we have to optimize the distance that a rubber band with a spin can reach. So, a few definitions are made. Um, um, a rubber band we define as a loop of rubber, round or oval shape, with this um, given uh, boundaries. So, for the uniformly stretched, um, we define as at the, uh, both sides are uh, stretched the uh, same direction. Um, and for the non-uniformly part, it is one side that, that one side is further stretched than the other part. And further to that, we define the elongation to be the difference. Um, in relation uh, to the non-stretched uh, non rubber band. To opt, uh, the task to optimize the distance we define as uh, maximizing, the opti um, the maximizing the distance and shooting direction within given start velocity for our rubber band. So I've brought a high-speed video with me where you can see how such a rubber band flies off to have a further understanding of what is going on. 
Um, this will be the structure of my report, so we will directly start with the experimental setup and the preliminary investigations. For that, we first um, had a look um, at the elastic properties of the rubber band. Uh, for that, we used an electric motor and a linear guide rail to stretch our rubber band, which is attached uh, to a force sensor in which we could uh, measure the uh, stress and uh, stress and strain relationship um, of such a rubber band because we do to expect a hyperelastic behavior of our rubber bands. To model that, we have one, the Neohukian model and one, the mooney rivlin model, which describes those um, stresses of our rubber bands. So, what we did, we measured the stress and strain relationship and then both fitted one the Neohukian and one the mooney rivlin model. What we could see, that the mooney rivlin fits much better and that we have a maximal force at full stretching. Further to that, uh, we stretched our rubber bands multiple, ti uh, multiple times and measured the maximal force. To get to this graph, what we can see here, we've got a great loss in, uh, in force and stiffness and that we should reuse every rubber band only once. Now, to actually come to shooting our rubber bands, uh, we've got the setup uh, where we have uh, this uh, trigger wheel and the lifter to release the rubber band and the holding pin to actually stretch that, which is attached uh, to the profile track through and locking through. Now, if that is being placed on a tripod, uh, we can vary the shooting height, the shooting angle, the strain, um, and the elongation, as I explained earlier. So, how did we actually execute our measurements? Um, here's the coordinate system. Um, in shooting direction, for our case, it's always the x direction, um, and the height is in the z direction. So, we measured uh, the distance in x direction, and we showed um, over um, 100 rubber bands uh, per measurement uh, due to the um, given error by every rubber band being a little bit different from uh, factoring. Uh, and then for errors, we actually then took the standard deviation from those 100 measurement points. So, uh, here you can again see what we define as the shooting angle and the shooting height. So, what we first did is a camera analysis of the flight. Um, uh, from the rubber band, uh, this is actually sideways. What we can see here that we have uh, three phases um, of uh, such a rubber band flying off. We have the first phase in which the rubber band gets released, the second phase uh, where we have a stabilization, and the third phase where the rubber band rotates as in, uh, rotates in a stabilized position. So, uh, what we can um, get out of that, we have a stabilization in phase two, and we can track the rotation in phase three, which is around 480 uh, radians per second, also very high um, rotational speed. So, uh, we can explain that the rotation um, stabilizes the rubber band into a hollow cylinder, which then can be a simplification made uh, to the movements of a rigid body um, throughout uh, the flight. So. Um, now, uh, what we uh, f uh, further did is to look out where this rotation uh, comes from, uh, from a uniformly stretched rubber band. And what we did is we done a high-speed camera analysis of the first phase, in which we could see that we have a stress wave propagating uh, through the rubber band when releasing, uh, which then, we, when we track it, we see that we have the back part moving with a constant velocity, and after the stress wave hits the front part, it also starts to move, but with a slower velocity, um, so the um, front part overtakes the back part, which then causes the rotation to happen. So, um, as a basic explanation, we can say that when releasing the rubber band, um, uh, that w no, when stretching the rubber band, we have a stored energy, um, which then um, causes, uh, when releasing the rubber band, into a uh, starting velocity and starting rotation, uh, which then causes, due to the conservation of angular momentum, the rubber band to stabilize vertical during the flight. Now, um, the non-uniformly stretched rubber bands, um, they have a secondary rotation due to that uh, unsymmetrically stretching, uh, which then causes the rubber band to, uh, to stabilize horizontal during the flight, which then causes different lift, drag, um, and magnus forces. So, for our further theoretical model, we will divide uh, this um, in one the forces and one the torques acting. Uh, this is not an exact... Um, as, uh, exact schematic. So, uh, what uh, we have, we have our stabilized hollow cylinder rotating in the air with a velocity um, omega. Due to that, we are, um, in that case, we have the gravitational force. We have, of course, the lift and the drag force and the Magnus force. Those, um, all those added up together um, cause then a resulting force, which we call F. 
So for the gravitational force, it's well known, as well as the lift and the drag force. In those cases, we have one the lift and one the drag um, coefficient in this case. Uh, we were actually not able to independently measure the lift coefficient. However, we were actually able to independently measure the drag coefficient um, in our wind tunnel uh, using a three-axis force sensor, uh, which then uh, is, is to be calculated, as you can see right here. Now, uh, for the uh, Magnus effect, um, on this uh, rotating um, cylinder, we have the Magnus effect occurring due to the um, uh, rotation. Uh, the um, air is uh, moving faster on the, uh, uh, up, uh, on the lower side and slower on the upper part, which then causes uh, a gradient of uh, a pressure gradient uh, on the both sides of the object, which then causes this uh, Magnus force, which, you can, uh, which can be calculated, as you can see right here. As well, for the Magnus force, we need a Magnus coefficient, which comes from the the same literature um, as our lift coefficient. So now uh, defining uh, those three unit vectors um, in our coordinate system, we can get to this um, differential equation to, this, uh, to, this, to model actually our forces, which can be seen right here. So now uh, to our torque definition, uh, we define our torque um, as the uh, deri uh, derivation from the angular momentum. Um, so we have one, uh, the torque due to the uh, two different application points um, of the uh, drag and the lift force, which can be calculated as you can see right here, and one, the torque due to the friction loss of angular velocity, um, which can, can be calculated with the moment of inertia uh, times the derivation from the angular velocity, which then can be added up together as you can see right here. So now we have the modeling of our forces and the modeling of our torque which then can be uh, both parts, can be assembled parts together with, uh, the, uh, with a numerical solution. In this case, we use the classical RK4 method. So now, uh, coming to my um, results, we first wanted to have a look um, at the comparison of our trajectory from a uniformly stretched rubber band. Um, here we tracked um, sideways. And what we can see here, that the, um, uh, that the experimental data very good matches with the um, simulated a trajectory. Uh, what we further did is uh, simulated um, our non-uniformly stretched rubber band. In one case, we have here the side view and one the top view. Um, okay. Uh, so um, um, what uh, to actually, uh, to, uh, when we have a, a movement in Y position, um, we, have, uh, we couldn't uh, just uh, take a camera from the side and, and check uh, those positions in the air. Um, so what we did is we had a look at the tilt angle of the rubber band during that flight, which then actually matches very good to our simulated data. So then, again, we varied uh, the sh uh, shooting um, height uh, in meters. What we can see here, that uh, we have a uh, clear increase of the shooting height uh, we are, uh, when uh, we have this uh, increase in the distance uh, shot. So. Um, um, furthermore, uh, we, uh, we varied um, our um, shooting angle. Um, what we can see here that our theory uh, very well predicts an optimum of about 30 degrees and that again our simulated data matches with that very well. So um, now to the unsymmetrically stretched uh, rubber bands, we have uh, three different elongations one of 0 0.5 centimeters uh, compared to a uniform stretched rubber band. What we can see um, is that um, by a strain of 2.3, the asymmetrically stretched rubber band flies um, about, um, about a meter uh, further than uh, the symmetrically, uh, symmetrically stretched does. The same can be observed with an elongation of one centimeter. Here the difference is a bit smaller. Um, and for um, the uh, distance, uh, for, the, uh, for the strain, um, uh, for the elongation of 1.5 centimeters, uh, we see that we have a clear optimum um, of uh, using um, an elongation of 1.5 centimeters. Um, a few, um, a few uh, important things can be seen here. Uh, we have an optimum, um, and then again the distance decreases. That can be explained, one, due to the um, plastic deformation happening when one side is further stretched than the other and then stretching the rubber band even more and we have a plastic deformation uh, so we have a loss of the conservated um, energy in this rubber band and uh, second of all um, the an, an, an higher strain um, with a an, uh, with an large um, asymmetrically stretching causes a uh, big rotation 
um, which then due to the Magnus force causes, as I stated earlier, a big movement in y direction, so we have a loss in x direction. So then after building a sophisticated setup, doing a um, very complicated camera analysis and deriving a theoretical model, um, and then shooting over 4,000 rubber bands in this uh, project, uh, I can say that for optimizing um, uh, that for optimizing the distance of one rubber band, we need the large shooting height, we need to use a fresh rubber band, an optimal shooting angle depending on the height of about 30 degrees. We need to optimistically stretch um, this rubber band. In our case, it's a strain of 2.3. Um, and we need a, a small surface area. Thank you for your attention, and I'm waiting to clarify the questions. Thank you. We now have two minutes for questions from the opponent. Yes. Just. Uh, the material um, constant, um, I try to find it again. Yeah, uh, the material um, constant um, we derive from our um, elasticity model. In this case, we used uh, the uh, Mooney Rivlin model, which we then fitted onto our stress and strain relation curve, which then we get to our uh, material um, constants. In this case, we have. Uh, and what were the values of them for your uh, rubber? What? Can what were the values of those constants? Um, I don't have the exact values because we didn't use them further um, in our. Um, um, uh, in our, could you in tell me, like in the persons, how repeatable were your measurements? How what? Uh, it's how hard. repeatable were your measurements, like in persons? Um, about ninety percent. Uh, okay, did you try using different sizes of the bands? Um, I didn't investigate different rubber bands uh, due to. Um, when you, t when you have one rubber band, you have some um, larger deviations in the manufacturing. Um, so I concentrated uh, about the parameters to optimize with one rubber band. However, um, I have some, I, 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 my theory um, and my, my modeling um, considers some parameters of the rubber band, for example, the surface area or the mass. Um, and yeah, for different okay, rubber bands, you have and, different uh, optimal My strengths. other question is, uh, how big is the impact of that air resistance? Of the air resistance, how big the impact? Um, uh, the impact is uh, not, not really um, an important factor. I, and I of the Magnus effect? Uh, the Magnus effect for the um, asymmetrically stretch, it's very big because you have a great movement in Y direction, as I showed in my graph. When shooting, okay. uh, when flying six meters, you have one meter. Okay. I think Thank we you. can put this no to discussion. Thank you. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zofia Lamenska. I represent Phoenix Science Club from Poland. And today I have a pleasure to open the problem number four, shooting rubber bands. So, first of all, we're amazed how great was the experimental setup of the team. We believe that there were clear investigation how how it can be achieved to have the very repeatable measurements. And we were also amazed how many different measurements they made. So, to have sure that there is no some deviations between them for big problems. Uh, there was also a theoretical model for the stress dependence of the strain. That's great that there were two models which were compared, so we can see uh, some deeper investigation into the problem. Uh, there was analysis of the shape of the rubber band during the time, so we can see how that rubber band actually looks like, which is great for the, our imagination, what the problem content really is about. There was a great quality of an explanation uh, why the non-uniform stretch rubber band flies further away, which the problem content states. There were many forces that were investigated, and not only those major ones as the strain, but also the minor ones, such as the air resistance and the Magnus effect. There was also a change in the parameters, such as the asymmetry and the stretch of the rubber band. 
However, I think that the presentation in some moments maybe wasn't clear enough. We didn't really understand how that difference in the stretches were achieved and how that rubber band was stretched. Uh, we believe that there could be also some investigation of that contact angle on which the rubber band is shot, in which like, axis it would rotate, for example, and what would be the effect on that for that distance maximum that is achieved. Uh, we also believe that you could like maybe change the angle on which the uh, like the rubber is shot not only in that axis but also in the other one, which would be really interesting for the deeper understanding of the problem. Uh, there wasn't a comparison for his theory for the different rubber bands and for different that maybe material constants for different sizes, which we believe that would give a better understanding of that. I think that the theory wasn't really clear. Uh, I think that it would be great if there was investigation what's the hook slow, what's the other one, and where that, that really comes from, what's the difference between those two theories, and why, what are the parameters between those theories that make they differ. Uh, moreover, there wasn't like that explanation of those difference model for stretch. We didn't really understand like how is that made and how what's the difference between the normal stretch and that non-uniform stretch that it, the problem content states. We also think that it would be great if you maybe did like many different types of the ununiform stretch. For example, like try to uh, make that two rubber bands out of the one uh, by like. Uh, maybe changing also that parameters are just making that kind of rubber band and that would be a great investigation of this problem and it would be great to deeper understand that. Uh, overall, we think that that explanation was great to really make us understand what the problem is about and we would like to go to some maybe minor points during the further discussion. So if you could show me the slide when you explain how is that non-uniform stress achieved? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, I don't, do you know the exact slide number? Um, uh, that's fine, we'll wait. Um, okay, uh, so I think you mean... Um, so um, let me ask, do you mean how I actually um, um, unsymmetrically stretched it? Yes, can you explain okay. that? So, um, as, I've, uh, as I earlier stated in my definitions, I define the elongation uh, to be the difference um, of the stretching from the one side to the other side in relation to the unsymmetrically stretched rubber band. So before stretching, I marked my rubber band, and then um, for that, uh, for that, from that mark, I um, I just. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I so stretch it for, I this, for this mark. I don't know I if I understand, earlier. but correctly. Yeah. But if you like have the rubber band here, that difference is between that side of the stretch no. and that side of the stretch. Yeah. So when you have the rubber band, um, so that um, you're on two points, and you just pull the rubber band up, so this side is further stretched than this side. And how do you achieve that? By by pulling, uh, by stretching the rubber band on a, uh, uh, more on a certain side. It stays in this position due to the um, high friction um, on the wooden um, holding uh, pin and the um, rubber uh, and the. And what band. were the values of that uh, change in the strain? There were 0 0.5, 1, and 1 1.5 centimeters in relation uh, to. Um, to the, uh, to the unstretched rubber okay, band. Okay, could you show earlier. us the slide where on which it is? Um, the, so you mean uh, the data? Yes, the data. Um, sure, no problem. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, that was uh, for an um, um, unsymmetrically stretched rubber band with an elongation of 0 0.5 for one and 1.5 centimeters of elongation. 
those were the data. Uh, those are all the unsymmetrically stretched rubber bands, and this is the uniformly stretched rubber bands, and you can here clearly see as an optimum, as I stated um, in the report earlier. Okay, thank you. And no I wonder problem. how does like material constants change with that uh, different elongations? Sorry, can you? How does material constants change with that elongation? The material, I mean, it's the same material. The material constants, which I fitted before in the stress and strain relationship, stay the same. However, when stretching the rubber band, um, and you um, stretch the rubber band too much, you get into a uh, plastical deformation instead of an elastical deformation. That could be one reason why the distance goes down on the uh, And did here. you observe that? Uh, the plastical deformations? Um, I uh, didn't um, observe the plastical uh, deformations um, dependently, but however, I mean, when you imagine a rubber band stretched, uh, stretched very much, you know that the rubber band on some, high, um, on some point has a uh, plastical deformation. Yes, so we agree with the, with the reporter that like, that's very important. And uh, that also shows that he did only like one measurement for the one uh, rubber, so that he didn't have that point, that problem in his measurements. And we agree that's the very important factor. Okay. Uh, okay, could you show us that theoretical predictions where you have the Hooke's law at the beginning of your presentation? The uh, neo hookian model, it's not the Hooke's law. You yeah. mean the neo hookian model, okay, no problem. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Um, you mean those two? Um, those two? Yes, can you tell us what's like that additional factor in the Muni Rivellini model and how it affects? Um, I didn't derive the Muni uh, Rivellini model from scientific research myself. I mean, those two are um, two given models uh, from literature, you can see right here, to describe the um, stress and strain uh, relationship or the stress in the rubber band. Um, so um, I took those two from literature. Um, I can't, ex I can't, ex uh, I can't um, ex uh, tell you clearly um, how those two models are uh, to be derived, as you can see right here. I mean, and could you show us like the plots when you have that theory and measurement comparison? Yeah, sure. That one. Yes. So uh, where does those theories? Uh, where is the difference like observed the biggest for those theories? Can you explain more I about mean, that? You, you see that the Mooney Rivlin model on this case fits much better um, as the uh, Neo Hukian does. Um, I, I personally think because of this second parameter which is getting fitted right here. I mean, you have one the shear model and one the material specific parameter, um, and you fit those two to a rubber band um, to get to the, your, um, to measure actually then your um, elastic properties of the rubber band. Okay, you didn't measure the shear modulus, but I would like to ask, how do you think that like, the maximal distance would depend on the shear modulus? Um, I mean, um, when, um, I mean uh, your rubber band um, has an, so you talk about the maximal uh, distance, not, not um, correct. The maximal distance, um, yeah, um, with a uh, bigger shear module, um, you, uh, when stretching the rubber band, uh, to its optimal point, right before the um, plastic deformation, um, you, have an, um, in, you have a larger starting velocity, which then, of course, causes the rubber band to fly um, further. Okay, uh, we agree with the opponent that uh, that is how that works. And my other uh, question is, like, what was that axis of rotation of your rubber band? The axis of rotation? Yeah, like, uh, how did it exactly rotate? So, um, no problem. Uh, let me go. Okay, uh, so here we are at my theoretical model. And is that like? The rubber band rotates around this um, axis. If okay, it, that, but if my that question is, question. is like, like that perpendicular or is that in that axis that is perpendicular to the surface? It is like that axis maybe the, parallel that axis, to the surface? Yes. Um, uh, for the, ver I mean, it depends. Talking about the vertical or the horizontal stabilizer. Yes, that's my question. For what like, position did you do your measurements? Um, I mean, I, I investigated both. I investigated one, the mm -hmm. uh, uniformly stretched rubber band, which then 
um, are uh, vertical stabilizers in the air and one the um, unsymmetrically stretched ones which then horizontally stabilized in the air. So uh, then you have uh, the rotation axis pointing downwards with an um, increasing uh, angle. And could you show us uh, once again that uh, slide when you, so when you check that maximal distance dependent on the uh, like strain difference? On the what? On the strain difference. On the strain difference. So the measurements I showed earlier from before. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Okay, so here we are at my experimental data. So um, here um, I varied the strain. Here you can see in gray the results from a uniform stretched one and in blue the results for an unsymmetrically stretched one. And for one. which axis of rotation are those measurements exact? For the, uh, I mean for the, um, for the uniformly stretched one uh, you have uh, the vertical stabilization. Um, so, um, yeah, so you have and the vertical didn't stabilization. Didn't you observe the horizontal, uh, maybe, horizontal stabilization for that? The, for the horizontal stabilization? Did you observe like the horizontal stabilization for like maybe both of those uh, like uniform and non-uniformly stretched bands? I don't quite understand your question. So, again, when you have a uniformly stretched rubber band, you have a vertical stabilization of the rubber band during the flight, which then causes the rotational axis to be horizontal. Yes, when, but I when you understand, have but my question is like, was that always the case, or did you observe some maybe deviations from that tendency? For the vertical stabilized one, it was always the case, as I said earlier, and for the horizontal, um, as I mean, when you have the horizontal stabilization, the vertical axis during, uh, was always the same. During the flight, it changed its angle, but it was all in the same position, I mean. Okay, and how Magnus effects depends on the axis of rotation? I mean, the Magnus effect, the direction of the Magnus effect changed. I mean, from vertical stabilization, it, the Magnus, uh, the Magnus um, force occurred downwards, and for the horizontal stabilization, as I showed earlier, um, the rubber band moved in Y direction due to the um, Magnus effect being um, in the Y direction. Okay, and for... Time, time's up. Okay, to summarize the discussion, I think we explained first of all uh, how this terrain difference is really made, which wasn't really clear during the presentations. Uh, then we talk about some difference in the theories and how that theory affects our measurements. We talk about the problem content, which is the non-uniform uh, stretch and uh, how it differs from the uniform stretch. Uh, we also talk about the important of the, uh, every parameter on the problem and how that may affects the maximal distance. Uh, overall, I believe that our discussion um, concluded to that deeper understanding on the problem. And I'd like to thank the opponent for the fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, so, hello. First of all, thank you for the report and the discussion. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to ask, what percent of distance has the rubber, uh, rubber band covered when it reached the third phase? Sorry, can you repeat again? Uh, so, what, dis what percent of the distance has the uh, rubber band uh, covered when it reached the third phase for the uniform and un non-uniform uh, stretches? So, when it hit the ground, you mean? Uh, no, the third phase was when it was, like, stabilized. Stabilized. Yeah, I mean, it's. Do you mean the surface of the rubber band? No, like uh, how fast did it stabilize? Uh, the stabilization is very is a very short period of time. Good, yeah, good question. I me uh, didn't mention that. In my presentation. So okay, uh, so how did you calculate the drag force coefficient? The what? Drag uh, drag force coefficient. Um, I didn't calculate. I measured the drag coefficient in my wind in a wind tunnel. I used, a model, I used uh, uh, the model of a rubber band in a wind tunnel and then measured with a three-axis force sensor um, how mm -hmm. the rubber band behaves in that 3D and mm -hmm. wind tunnel. Okay, uh, so what boundary conditions did you have for the numerical analysis, like numerical solvation? I mean, the boundary conditions are that I have a uh, stabilized um, hollow cylinder rotating one vertical and one horizontally in the air. I mean, mm -hmm. if that's... That's the boundary conditions for this. Uh, 
Okay, let's move on. Uh, so, uh, did you uh, did you compare the theoretical like distance for the non-uniform and uniform uh, stretches? Uh, for comparing the distance from non-uniform to uniform, yes, that was this is this graph. The this theoretical the theoretical analysis. Like, did you compare no, the no, theoretical I results? Didn't. No, I didn't compare. So no. Okay. Uh, so for the opponents, a question. So do you think what well, do you think that the air friction is relevant in this problem? I think that air friction has some impact on the problem, and uh, but it isn't like such a big force. I believe that it may be like very small percent that it takes, and it really doesn't change that maximal distance. However, it should be uh, taken into account. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, to the reporter, so to conclude, for what parameters did you receive the optimal distance? For, for what parameters? Like, yeah. I investigated the parameters isolate, uh, isolated. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, hello. First of all, thanks for the, uh, for the interesting report and the opposition. So, I'm Katie, I'm, I'm going to review the problem. Uh, so the problem statement is, uh, as you know, and we thought that the important factors were the material of the rubber bands, the stretch length, throwing angle, initial size, and the stretching distribution in the rubber. Uh, so first of all, the strength of the uh, review of the reporter was that. Um, he explained what the non-uniform stretching was, and he had a clear explanation of the phenomenon. So first of all, he showed us what happened in the no uh, uniform stretching, and uh, how was the non-uniform stretching, uh, how did it compare to the non-uniform stre stretching. And he then uh, proceeded with um, explaining all the forces that were acting on both. Like uh, He uh, offered us the theoretical uh, formulas for both, uh, with the forces and torques for both the non-uniform and uniform stretchings. And uh, he, he also had measured like stress versus, had, uh, stress versus strain graphs and also measured it. And uh, for the experiments, I had varied many pr experiments, such as uh, varied uh, shooting height and shooting angle. And he had advanced setup uh, with four sensors and uh, linear guide rails and electric motor and um, he, uh, he did same experiment many times to avoid the error and uh, make, make sure it was repeatable and he also divided the motion into phases and detailed the explanation of the graphs um, and also she, he had uh, shaped the analyzation and shape, uh, shape analyzation and had measured the drag force in wind tunnel and for the weaknesses the formulas were a bit unclear and it was unclear how he calculated the friction uh, in the air uh, at first, and also he didn't show the boundary conditions for solving the differential equations, and um, he also showed the formulas for the uh, material and constants that didn't uh, he didn't use in the theory. And um, also, it was uh, quite unclear how why he wasn't able to measure some parameters which he took uh, from the. Uh, internet or resources and didn't take into consider consideration the air resistance and didn't have errors, uh, error bursts on the x-axis and uh, there were some parameters he didn't change and um, he had only one way of stretching it non-uniformly and the theory and the experiment theoretically it was not compared to non-uniform and uh, uniform bending. So for the opponent, she asked about the calculations of the material and constant, constant and asked about the air resistant um, and she made sure that we understood the uh, uh, bending process better, which I think was really kind of blurry in the presentation, and I liked that. And um, uh, she also mentioned that it would it will, would be better to use different ways of non-uniform stretching. And uh, I think that this is quite important because what if we stretch like um, in the early, earlier point, like there were a lot of ways to stretch it non-uniformly, and I think just. Um, Investigating one of them was uh, not enough for the uh, maximal optimization of this problem. Um, she also made the reporter explain some un unclear graphs, but I think that the weakness that she had was that um, she mentions that uh, he didn't uh, uh, change. She didn't change. Mentions that he hadn't uh, changed the shooting angle, and also mentions that the reporter didn't explain uh, uniform stretching, non-uniform uh, stretching. Uh, so for the discussion. Um, so the discussion point was the material constant change with elongation, and uh, the reporter uh, explained it with like classical deformations, and we agree with him. And after that, uh, they uh, explained the shear modulus uh, versus maximal distance, and we agree that the bigger the modulus, uh, shear modulus, the bigger the distance. Uh, so. 
In the end, I think this was quite comprehensible and the discussion. Uh, we saw like how um, some experiments were done and uh, we got more information about the uh, unclear graphs and un unclear parameters that were uh, quite uh, fitted and uh, got it that way. So thanks for the interesting opposition and discussion and uh, the report. Thank you. We now have two minutes for concluding remarks. Okay, first of all, thank you for this uh, great fight. I think we had a good discussion um, here on stage. Um, and thank you to the reviewer, uh, you did a quite good job. Uh, but there are a few points I, I want to point out. The air resistance was actually considered um, in my theory. Um, it was considered with this independently measured um, coefficient uh, in the wind tunnel. Um, there are a further few points uh, that um, um, I did vary the shooting angle, which the opponent stated, which was clearly in my presentation. Um, however, investigation, uh, investigating different types of uh, ununiform stretching um, is, uh, I personally think, a good approach. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Then we have now five minutes for questions of the jury, and I'd like to ask the uh, opponent and reviewer to also go to the stage. Question to the reporter. So I understand that you only considered one length of the rubber band. Suppose you were to generalize this to arbitrary length and you wanted to understand how far you should stretch it. Should you think of it as a stretch of a distance or as a fraction of the band's length and why? Um, for opt, uh, for uh, finding the optimal strain as a uh, friction, but um, for, uh, the, uh, for the maximal um, distance, for maximal velocity, um, I would consider it as a distance. Okay, does the opponent agree with that? Yes, we agree with that. Okay, I have a question to the reporter. Uh, if I remember correctly, you said that the reason it, uh, the non-uniformly stretched rubber band flies further is the stabilization. Is that correct? The stabilization into an horizontal... Into a horizontal ring. Into a horizontal... Um, yes. Uh, but why does a horizontal ring fly further? Uh, I didn't get this uh, qualitative um, you uh, have, uh, argument. Uh, the uh, the um, air friction stays the same for the surface area, but for the lift, um, you have a bigger uh, surface area for the lift. And, okay. and also the, uh, the Magnus force is not pointing downwards, uh, so sideways. Uh, that for smaller distances has then less account, but for larger distances then more account. So okay, thank you. That answers your question. I have also a question to the reporter. My question is somehow related to his question. Uh, could you briefly elaborate why, the why uh, asymmetric stretching uh, leads to an horizontal um, stabilization. Yeah. Due to that asymmetrically stretching, you cause a secondary spin in the rubber band. Uh, additionally to that uh, spin uh, from the overtaking uh, uh, the back part of the front, front part, uh, which then causes a horizontal stabilization to the conservation but of would angular that, momentum. wouldn't that lead to a kind of um, crooked uh, stabilization, not really a horizontal, but kind of in the middle between vertical and horizontal, because uh, you have two stabilization regimes. No, it wouldn't. I mean, um, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I state that it wouldn't. Okay, thank you. A question to the reporter. The cross-section of the rubber band was circular, I understood from the photographs. Did you also check on the, or let's say, rectangular rubber bands like you use in the VEC classes or marmalade classes, what would I there be the, the consequences? Um, um, the, conse uh, uh, the consequences um, um, obtaining the um, surface area. Um, I mean, uh, you would um, have a different surface area. So, I mean, you, have to, you would have a different surface area for, um, uh, for different geometries. Okay. I have two, two quick questions. One is, uh, uh, I do answer, understand correctly that you have no theoretical prediction for the un, unevenly stretched rubber band. I have a theoretical prediction. I didn't match it. I mean, I, ca I can't... Okay, so you didn't. So in your presentation, there was none. Yes. And the second, my second question is, you say that there are like two different regimes for 
unevenly stretched and and evenly yes. but like it's it's not a binary process i can uh, stretch it unevenly to a very small extent like a millimeter or two millimeters so so where's the threshold when because what you say it's either horizontal or vertical and my question is like where's the threshold what's the minimum unsymmetry there to switch it i haven't precise uh, precisely investigated it um, but I would uh, personally predict something like 10% of unsymmetrically stretching um, in correlation to uh, the non-stretched rubber band. So, like 10% elongation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Then, no? Um, do you have any other questions from the jury? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, 28, please, slide 28 to the reporter. Um, the very bottom two... Uh, points there, the elongation, like the uh, uneven elongation, does not go farther. Do you have a quick qualitative explanation for that? Uh, no, I don't have. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, I think we are out of time and we'll proceed to grading. Is everyone ready? As far as I can see, yes. Perfect. Um, then, thank you all. For this great round, we have like a few great short comments. Um, first, Martin on the report in the lower end. Uh, okay, so uh, to be very open, I, I honestly basically disagree with the solution uh, from, from two aspects. The first one, uh, I don't think you really managed to solve the task because the theory itself is not is not addressing the unevenly stretched rubber band and this was the main part of the task and your theory was only solving the evenly stretched rubber band so that's like a, and then the the task said about the optimization and then you said you did the optimization separately on on the different parameters but like if you want to optimize then you have to optimize it totally uh second second point is that uh, i i simply cannot agree with the approach that if it's evenly stretched, it's, it's one direction, and if it's uneven, unevenly stretched, it's a different direction. There must be uh, a gradual change of the direction. And the third thing is that I, I prepared uh, this, this problem for the Slovak uh, preparatory seminar, so I know quite a lot about the problem, and it's not really much correlated with like your, your, your input. So basically these were the three pillars of why my grade went uh, rather down. Okay, um, thank you. Then we have Marcus on the other end. Yes, I thought um, there were some holes in the story and I agree with my colleague here, but overall I think what I liked is that you very, in the, in the, in the beginning, you very clearly defined your problem. You very clearly defined your hypothesis very clearly, in a crisp way that I have not seen before. And I think that was something that I, I enjoyed. Yes, there are approximations to be made here. Yes, there are different regimes to be made here. But, but the, the picture you presented, the physical picture you presented was concise, and I think the approximations were sound. In the, um, in the uh, discussion, I thought you, you tried to answer all the questions. Um, Again, more exploration of the parameters would probably be a good idea, but that's for the next time. Thank you very much. Then for the opposition, we have on the lower end, Andrea. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so there were a few good points, of course, um, and few uh, points where it could be improved. So um, I like the opposition speech, so you understood what the problem was about, uh, but then you raised some topics that I think that were covered in the, um, this presentation, and um, I didn't see, uh, so I guess you just missed them. Um, and then in the discussion, I kind of, um, you spent quite some time on this, uh, on few topics uh, about the theory, and I was not really sure what it was aiming to. So you didn't give any uh, own opinions. What? You, um, so for me, it was not clear um, where it's kind of um, where it's going. Yeah. 
Thank you. And then for the higher end. Yeah, the higher it? end. Um, I was quite impressed uh, from the opponent um, how it summarized the questions asked using the time. Uh, particularly, also, you ask for the dimensions and the comparison of the three uh, sigma equations. So this is a very good point there. Uh, you asked and raised air resistance mag magnus effect. So you put all the physics on the table. That is important to discuss it. And you put a very, you had a you guided a very good um, discussion. This is why I gave the highest higher record. Thank you very much. Then for the review, we had on the lower end, Jonathan. So uh, it was not like a bad review. There were just some caveats that uh, really uh, lost you some points in, on, on my side at least. So like the review of the report was filled with a lot of things, but I felt like it was all over the place from like the priority. Uh, there was like a lot of things that were, were interesting to, to address and then there were a lot of things that were just padding it felt like. Uh, then in the review of the opposition, I felt like you even had some some uh, things that were just not correct, <laughs> like the, that, that were addressed and that were addressed differently than you presented them. And I, and I feel like the reviewer, that's the part of the reviewer, you have a lot of time to try to concentrate on what actually is going on. And then the discussion analysis was just uh, average because like, I feel like there was more discussed than you covered and you had more time. So I feel like there would have been potential there. Thank you. And then on the higher end, we had Daniel. Uh, yeah, I was on the higher end because <coughs> I thought very openly that the uh, review was very well done from my point of view. I think the uh, summary of the uh, report and the opposition was quite comprehensive in my opinion and the review was the only one who brought up the discrepancy of the numerical setup I think because at some point you have to feed the numerical uh, differ the differential equation with some initial conditions and this was not explained very well in the in the report how it is done and the reviewer actually brought this up um, and the yeah some uh, small points were uh, subtracted from my side because some questions were actually covered already in the uh, discussion from opponent and report reporter and were just asked twice and unnecessarily but apart from that, it was very perfect. Okay, thank you very much for giving comments and justification of your grades. With this, I would like to ask everyone to give a warm round of applause for our finalists, and then we have a break. Good. So, after two very exciting first round of this year's AYPT final. It will finally come, or at the end, come to a close. We'll have now the third round with Team Poland presenting um, task number 11, Pumping Straw, Team of Georgia doing the opposition, and Team of Germany performing the review. Um, I would like to ask everyone, I think everyone is back here, so I think we can start whenever Team Poland is ready. Um, one, um, oh, is there a question? No? Uh, just one, one thing um, before, before we start, sorry. Um, afterwards, we will try to be as quick as possible since some teams need to leave. So I would like to ask all of the participants to briefly help us get the um, tables outside and the chairs back here. Um, so all the younger participants, please help. And then afterwards, we'll have a sh short um, speech by um, Professor Dr. Christian Teichert to directed towards all the participants, after which we'll hand out the certificates and close the competition. So please help. Okay, I think we can start now. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bartosz Mazurek. I'm representing Phoenix Science Club, and I would like to present to you our solution to problem number 11, pumping straw. So, the problem content states, a simple water pump can be made using a straw shaped into a triangle and cut open at the vertices. When such a triangle is partially immersed in water, with one of its vertices and rotated around its vertical axis, water may flow up through the straw. Investigate how the geometry and other relevant parameters affect the pumping speed. So, this is our phenomenon presentation, and as we can see, if we partially immerse our pumping straw in water and start to rotate it with high enough frequency, the water comes from the straws. Uh, so, going to the qualitative explanation, uh, what caused this phenomenon? Um, 
At the, uh, at the beginning, we, if we immerse partially our straw in water and start to rotate it around the vertical axis, on this small part of water starts to act the centrifugal force, and the, comp and the component of this force parallel to the straw is pushing the water forward. And uh, when the level of water increases, um, the mass of water in straw increases, and the uh, center of mass of this water is moving away from the axis of rotation, so the force increases, and water comes uh, out from the straw. So uh, we made our experimental setup, and I will briefly explain each part of it. Um, so the, uh, the pumping straw itself, with uh, two straws, uh, cut it on the concrete length, hold it by the 3D printed holder to control the angle, and we can move it up and down to control the level of immersion. Um, we drive our pumping straw with a uh, um, motor with gears and control it using Arduino connected to the computer so we can control the frequency of spinning. And to our method of measuring, so we put the bucket with a scale in front of uh, our pumping straw so it covers the angle of theta of uh, water uh, spreading and we record the video of uh, this case, so we know the, rela we knows the relation of mass uh, in time, and we could calculate, knowing density and the theta angle, um, the overall flow. So, um, to keep the level of immersion uh, um, constant, we have to keep the level of water constant, and for this purpose, uh, we use the pump, which pumps the water, um, so the level of uh, uh, water is uh, constant in time. And if we connect uh, every part, we could see that if the pumping is spinning, it spreads water all around, and some of this water is going to the container, so we have the change on the scale. And uh, this is our measurement, so we could see, as we expected from qualitative explanation, that if we rotate our straws faster, the flow will be higher. Um, and uh, so, firstly, we, we would like to know what is the pressure at point B, uh, at the bottom of the straw, which is immersed and HB. So we could draw the streamline in which the um, uh, energy is constant, for example, to the surface, because we exactly know what is the pressure at the surface, and we could use Bernoulli principle to um, find out this changing of energy. And in our case, because we know that on the surface uh, we have just an atmospheric pressure, and if we assume that in point B, the, uh, the velocity of water will be uh, the average velocity in the straw, we could find the pressure at point B. And um, the pressure, we know that the pressure distribution in our straw must be continuous. So the pressure at the bottom plus the change in pressure um, in straw must be equal to the pressure at the top, which is the atmospheric pressure. So we could write it, and we know that we have uh, the difference in pressure because the, of the centrifugal force, and because our um, water have the mass, so because of the gravitational force. And then in we, uh, we could calculate the flow, and um, because the level of immersion is really small uh, in comparison to the length, we could um, um, this component is negligible. So uh, this is our uh, theory and measurements, and as we could see, our theory overestimates uh, um, the reality, so we know that there must be some more um, uh, pressure lost in our straws. So, uh, for ex uh, we, because we know that uh, our water is viscous, there must be some uh, drag and the pressure loss because of this drag. And we can use hagen poiseuille equation, which describes this pressure loss in laminar flow. So, we use it, and we could put it in, as one of the components of this pressure distribution. And then we know our, uh, our flow. So, uh, we could see that it a little bit better estimates um, our measurements, but there is still some uh, negative pressure uh, in the straws which we didn't calculate. So we could investigate how, uh, the, um, how looks the pressure lost and the intel of the straw, because when the water is going from all the sides to the straw, um, they will go uh, especially to the um, middle part of the straw, 
uh, and it will be harder for the water to go to the sides of the straw. So the effective cross-sectional area of the straw is smaller then, so we have to use uh, more energy to push this water forward. Um, and um, we could estimate it uh, using, um, um, using this gamma uh, from literature, which for such a straw is, uh, uh, is a half. And we could put this correction in our uh, model. And now we have a new equation for flow. And uh, we could see that it better corresponds to our uh, measurements. Mm, OK. Uh, and for those uh, small flow, we have really good correspondence of theory and measurements. Mm, and why is that? Maybe because uh, we have um, different types of regime in our flow. So we could have investigate it using the Reynolds number uh, because we know that for turbulent flow, there must be some more loss of the pressure because uh, due to the drag. So uh, we, we could calculate um, this Reynolds number. So I create the graph uh, when we have the Reynolds number on the y, y axis. And we could see that our theory corresponds good for a small Reynolds number for those laminar regime, but um, it doesn't correspond so good for um, turbulent regime. And maybe that's because we use the hagen poiseuille equation, which um, explain the pressure loss in a laminar flow. So we could use uh, darcy Weisbach equation, which explains the flow um, in turbulent flow. Uh, into a turbulent regime, and because we don't know our constants of material of the straw, we have to assume that the friction factor, which is dependent on the Reynolds number, is for the perfectly smooth uh, straw. And we think that this estimation is, uh, is quite accurate. Um, and uh, if we change uh, our drag pressure lost uh, for this uh, darcy weisbach equation, we could uh, create new equation for flow. And as we could see, our theory corresponds uh, really, really good um, in this case, even for those higher Reynolds number. So uh, let's uh, talk what is the, the most important in our um, pressure equations. And as we can, could see, the centrifugal force uh, pressure, loss, uh, pressure is uh, the highest, then the gravity uh, pressure loss, the drag uh, loss, inlet, and contraction. Um, so we know for it that, of course, we assume that this uh, inlet uh, contraction is for a uh, straw which is perpendicular to the surface, but uh, because we don't know how it depends from the angle, but because this uh, part is so small, there will be not so much uh, change uh, in it. So uh, we use different materials to control different parameters. And those parameters uh, which we think that are relevant are the length of the strokes, the diameter of straw, the inclination angle, uh, immersion depth, and the velocity of rotation. And uh, firstly, we could uh, see the graph from uh, the radius. So as we could see from a qualitative explanation, if we have higher radius, the mass of the water in, uh, in our straw will be higher. So the centrifugal force um, from this mass will be higher. So we could expect the higher flow. And um, uh, we could see that there is some deviation uh, for this point. And um, that's because um, in our phenomenon for really small um, um, angular velocity, the water uh, doesn't take all the volume of our straw. But our theory has expected that uh, Mm, this radius, uh, which is not true in this case. So uh, that's why mm, our theory doesn't correspond really good for uh, small uh, angular velocity. And uh, going to the angle of inclination, and again, as we could expect for a qualitative explanation, if the angle is smaller, the component of centrifugal force is uh, larger and gravitational force smaller. So for a smaller angle, the flow is um, higher. And we could see here the same, that for um, um, small uh, angular velocity, uh, it's the same case and, uh, as if uh, we have a higher radius. And uh, going to the length of the straws, we could see uh, that for longer straw, um, 
the uh, overall flow is higher too. And um, as, as we could uh, expect from qualitative explanation, because the volume of water and mass of this water in a straw is higher, so the centrifugal uh, force is higher again. So, going to the conclusions, our experimental setup let us precisely measure uh, the flow. Um, we um, define the relevant uh, parameters as the length of the straw, inclination angle, inclination angle radius, and an angular velocity. We think that immersion from our experiment is so small that this pressure uh, difference because of the hydrostatic pressure is uh, too small to calculate it. Uh, it's not really important. Um, and our theory greatly predicts the trend of the flow. Um, it a little bit overestimates this flow. This is because we couldn't include all the pressure losses because our setup is turning around and it's hard to um, calculate it. Um, what, the, what more pressure losses will be due to this fact? And because all, most of our uh, measurements are in um, turbulent regime, the darcy weisbach equation corresponds better um, in our case. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want uh, I wonder uh, on the phenomenon explanation uh, slide we saw the droplets coming out. So, is this because of the phenomenon and part of it, or is this fault of the camera? Uh, could you repeat the water? We saw the droplets coming out, not as the one system water. So, is it any phenomenon part, or the, is it a camera problem? Yes. So, for the small velocity or uh, for the small flow, uh, sometimes. Uh, Only droplets droplet come out. Not okay, thank you. The um, on this, uh, can you move on uh, slide uh, 13? Um, I'm sure. And um, uh, yeah. you mentioned the average uh, speed on that slide. So I, um, I am asking, um, why did you say uh, average velocity? Is the velocity changing during moving the in the straw? Water? Yes, uh, uh, that's that's an assumption which we think that is accurate because. Uh, so it's accelerating. Uh, in the show, or is it moving with the same velocity? Uh, it's moving in the same velocity. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, you said um, you mentioned darcy Welbacher uh, formula for the turbulent flow. So, um, where does this come, uh, formula come from, and is it uh, the empirical formula or is it purely theoretical? Yes. So, uh, the darcy Weisbach uh, law, which I was talking about, uh, is from the literature, and. Um, the, um, it's a little bit engineering equation because uh, this friction factor is changing. Uh, so is it purely theoretical the or empirical formula? Uh, if it's purely uh, theoretical, uh, yes, there is, there is theory behind it and quite an explanation okay. which we uh, Thank use. you. Also, I'm uh, wondering if you have um, considered the whirlpool that is um, created when you rotate your system. Yes, so uh, sometimes for, for example, really high angular velocity, the whirlpool is creating and... Um, Did you consider the width, uh, height of it? Uh, the height of... Uh, whirlpool. No, I was okay. trying to don't create whirlpool because... Let's then, move this oh, to sorry. the discussion. Yes, we're out of time. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Marian Skitishvili. I'm from Georgia, and today I will be opponent for problem number 11, pumping straw. The problem statement was that a simple wet pump, uh, water pump can be made using a straw shaped into a triangle and cut open at the uh, ver uh, vertices uh, when such a triangle is uh, particularly Im immersed in water with one of its uh, vertices and rotate around the vertical axis, water may flow up through the straw. So uh, the reporter uh, must have investigated how the geometry and the other relevant parameters affect the pumping speed and we think that important factors are angular velocity, length of the straw, diameter of the straw, immersion uh, depth and, and angle between the straws. Uh, so now to mo uh, move on uh, general review. Um, the phenomenon was explained that uh, the force that is um, caused by rotating the straw, centripetal force, uh, must have exceed uh, the gravity force so that the water comes up in the straw, therefore it starts to uh, come out. And in theoretical model, uh, he has written Bernoulli force for laminar uh, flow, and then uh, for laminar flow, he added um, uh, uh, he added Poisson uh, 
Poisson formula and he calculated the theory like that, but because it was not very good match for the uh, uh, tur turbulent flow, he tried to write theory for um, turbulent flow also and uh, wrote darcy weilbacher formula. Um, and uh, in experimental setup, he, ha he had very controllable environment where he kept the level the same and also was controlling the angle between the uh, straws. And in data analysis, um, uh, he uh, explained why some points were not good match for the theory and um, uh, showed us depend dependence on his parameters. So now to move on on uh, no, more um, or specific explanation, the strengths were that um, the uh, f uh, phenomenon was clearly uh, explained by the animations and also the forces that was uh, causing this phenomenon. Also, he um, uh, explained uh, uh, what um, uh, equations may be applicable for what, um, uh, for, for which case, and he also showed us the um, uh, of uh, from what um, uh, in what uh, part of the angular velocity was the lam uh, flow laminar and turbulent, and also he uh, uh, he exp uh, showed us the, uh, his parameter changing uh, such as uh, the angle and um, uh, diameter of the straw. Uh, so um, we think that impro uh, improbable sides are that uh, formulas um, of darcy Walbacher, where it came from was a little bit unclear and I wanted to also ask in the discussion um, and also um, um, uh, we um, couldn't, um, I, uh, I also wonder, and I ask any questions, why the, uh, the water comes as a droplet and not as a f um, no, one flow. Um, and he said that it was because of this phenomenon. And also uh, in experiments, he, um, he, he hasn't shown, and I wonder if he has calculated uh, the critical points where this phenomenon doesn't occur. And uh, also um, he said that he hasn't take, uh, taken consideration uh, occur the whirlpool, uh, so that we think that uh, occurring the whirlpool may have changed the uh, immersion height. Uh, so um, uh, we, uh, I think we will discuss about how big effect it may um, uh, it cause. And also, um, um, I want to discuss um, in data analysis while, while still adjusting his theory uh, to his uh, experiment, why does the some points still are missing on the theory line and why does he have this uh, kind of um, uh, errors? Uh, thank you. So now we can start discussion. Yes. Um, so now to start from the phenomenon, you said that the droplets were coming out from the straw uh, yes. itself. So um, why does the droplets come out and not the flow? Yes, so for the uh, small uh, flow, uh, droplets come out of the streamline and that's, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, not relevant in our uh, case because uh, this happened after those uh, water goes from... Oh, so you uh, mean the droplets are separating each other after they're coming out, yes. not on the edge of the straw? As we could see on this photo, and uh, this effect uh, is because... Um, so, so the droplets are separated after it comes out from the straw, not yes, on the edge of yes. the straw? Yes, and it's because it's optimal... Uh, 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 optimal from yeah, the but I was asking on the edge, of, on the yeah. edge of the straw. So it's the flow, not the uh, separate droplets that come out. Yes, yeah? yes. So okay, then okay, it's I understand. Um, okay, uh, um, I um, let's discuss about darcy Walbacher and turbulent flow. Yes, sure. Um, so so um, can you show me show how you this yeah. equation? Um, mm -hmm. How do we get this equation, and where does it come from? No. Uh, okay, so uh, of course. So uh, darcy Weisbach equation comes from the uh, literature and as we could see it uh, explains the um, pressure loss due to uh, some uh, parameters such as the length of the um, of the tube because um, it um, you it, uh, here is the parameter uh, friction factor um, uh, yes yes, yes. Uh, what so, friction is it if you can explain it yes so um, it, it shows how this pressure, uh, um, um, the uh, loss of pressure in a tube, and this friction factor 
is uh, complicated because it depends on the Reynolds number. So if you have the Darcy Weisbach equation, which depends on the flow, yes, I, and from the okay. Reynolds number depends from the flow okay, too. Okay, it depends, but so, I wonder what friction is it between the layers of the uh, liquid or between the uh, walls of the, straw, uh, of the straw and the liquid? Yes, so we could uh, draw the, um, the water in a straw as uh, it has some layers. Yes. And we could see that because of these uh, thin layers, there are some friction. Yeah. So it's between the layers. Shape of, yes. So of it's similar to the viscosity, but it's for the turbulent flow? Uh, it's, uh, um, could because be the vis uh, we know the viscosity as a friction factor for the uh, uh, friction inside the layers. So if you're saying that these f um, this coefficient is also a friction between layers, but for the turbulent flow, it can refer to as the viscosity. But for the um, turbulent flow, am I right? Um, yes, so it depends from the f flow. So we measure the flow, okay. and if we measure the flow, we could calculate the Reynolds number and okay. put this Reynolds number again in this friction factor and then calculate the loss of pressure. So okay. we calculated it numerically. Okay. So that's why, uh, firstly, I use the uh, uh, poison, uh, uh, poison equation. Okay, so you change the poison. Uh, it is dependent from the viscosity. It is mm -hmm. maybe more clear, and we could calculate it uh, analytically. Okay, um, can you move on to slide 20, uh, 18, sorry. Sure. Um, so, um, uh, here we see the, uh, for the theoretical lines, here are two separate um, lines, so are there dif for the different? Yes, so uh, because on this uh, 2000 uh, um, Reynolds number, yes. there is this change of flow regime from the laminar. Yes, uh, so the for the laminar flow. flow, you have only one data for the blue one? Yes, in this case. Um, uh, and yes. uh, why is it still not fitting that well? So we see for the purple one, it is a very good match. And not for the red. You don't have any uh, red one uh, data, but we see the blue one. So why is it still off uh, the line? Yes, uh, it's because probably uh, the flow regime here was the turbulent one. Uh, was, but you uh, say yeah, it's, uh, it's under okay. the 2000. It, so Yes, um, it's laminar one. And uh, maybe it doesn't uh, perfectly uh, fit, uh, this uh, theory doesn't perfectly fit because um, the angle is really small. So uh, we could have uh, more friction loss uh, because of uh, the intel, for example. And uh, maybe that's the, that's the reason for it. Okay, have you made any assumptions in this problem? Uh, what, uh, Any assumptions that may cause this uh, de uh, deviation from the theory? Yes, yeah, so I, did, um, I didn't fit any parameters in, no, uh, oh, in I, the I theory. I guess you didn't if fit, you... but have you made any assumptions? Yes, so for example, in a, a Bernoulli principle, I assumed that the um, uh, velocity from which we want um, to accelerate the water is the velocity. Have you checked velocity. that assumption? Uh, Yes, uh, I've checked this. Uh, I mean, I know that this okay. assumption is uh, quite accurate, and that's because, uh, for, for yes, example, I, the turbulent flow. Yes, I also uh, think this, I, I don't think it's that much assumption, because if the flow was not, uh, didn't have the constant velocity, so the, um, uh, uh, the law of the uh, uh, reserving the mass uh, will be, would not uh, complete in our theory, which will be against the law. So mm. I don't think it's an assumption. So have you any got any assumptions yeah, anymore? So, um, I, I, um, I think that I should a little bit disagree because the uh, velocity depends on the um, cross-sectional area. Because, for example, um, the flow uh, perfectly uh, near the site is around zero, and the fastest uh, flow we have um, in the middle of our straw. But yeah, yeah I agree that okay. uh, this change is really small, especially if okay. with turbulent flow, as we could see on the slide. Um, okay, um, can you, um, on the 20, 27, slide 27, um, you mentioned that the red, dot, uh, red point was not corresponding to the laminar flow? Uh, the no, it, that it doesn't correspond to the, f um, that, it, that it doesn't correspond uh, due to the fact that um, the, f uh, the water is not 
um, it doesn't take all the volume of the straw. So our theory has this air in, um, in it, so it assumes that uh, the flow is all uh, in all cross-sectional area. Okay, so uh, maybe it's, uh, it is the critical point that uh, the phenomenon doesn't occur? Can it be, or have you many measured any critical points that the phenomenon wasn't occurring? Yeah, so uh, phenomenon um, is not occurring when this uh, um, component of uh, centrifugal force um, doesn't uh, is not high enough to. Um, uh, so, can, have yeah. you any range of any ex uh, angular acceleration, or you had the dimension dimension less acceleration? So. Mm. Have you got any range for that critical parameter? Because this red, I think it, this red uh, point may be in that range, so that um, that's why you, it didn't match any theory of you. Mm, so uh, I'm not sure if I understand you well, but uh, um, what I um, expect as the this minimum uh, value of the this angular velocity is when. Uh, this centrifugal compo component of centrifugal force parallel to the straw is uh, high enough to uh, push this water because that's the only one component which uh, creates the um, which adds the pressure uh, because uh, the rest of them uh, creates the negative pressure in our okay. straw. Um, so also, uh, I have a question about contraction force, uh, contraction um, yeah. pressure. Um, uh, what is this? Can you explain? Yes. Yeah, so and where do you where this formula comes from? Yes. Yeah, so this contraction is um, this pressure loss, uh, which we calculated uh, because we know that in the um, practical cross-sectional area on this inlet is smaller than the cross-sectional area of the straw. Because if the water goes from all the sides. Um, the, um, it can't uh, so easily go to the side of this uh, straw, so there is some smaller pressure in it. Um, and uh, oh, so the you consider of water that the pressure slower. on the bottom is not the same. Yeah, it could be. It and, changes. Uh, I draw it here, as we could see okay. on those sides. Uh, when those, uh, this flow goes from okay. on the sides. Okay, I think it's be, um, the accurate for this problem. So I also wondered. Um, uh, uh, for the whirlpool, how were you uh, uh, trying not to have that much whirlpool, or uh, how were you um, uh, just um, taking consideration that height that was changing for creating whirlpool? Yes. Yeah, so for all my measurements, um, I um, I don't have a whirlpool. So uh, to be sure that air is not going to my straw, and to do that. Um, I could put, uh, leave this straw like that, but there there is more area which um, Yeah, but when moves this moves, the, water, the whirlpool doesn't go, uh, creates around it? Um, no, it's too small, for example, like, okay. like that. This is for uh, some... I'm sorry, specific? but I think we're out of time. Please summarize the discussion. Um, mm. Thanks for the reporter. Um, I, uh, we had some disagreement about the uh, uh, vel constant velocity, but I think we finally agreed that uh, it's it's that the uh, flow in the inside the straw must help in the const at constant velocity. Um, uh, I also still don't understand our reporter's view why uh, may some points be off the theoretical line. Um, I uh, said my opinion about that. Some points may maybe in the range when the phenomenon doesn't occur or, uh, yeah, or doesn't occur. So it would, would have been nice to see uh, in what ranges does this happen. And, um, I, uh, and yes, um, other parameters that were not clear in uh, the report, I think in the discussion it was, um, the maybe forces where this come from and what effect it has. And also finally you know, for the whirlpool, I think uh, uh, he, uh, he uh, still should have estimated how much change it made right. and shown us if, okay. it, if it was negligible. Thank you very much. We now have three minutes. Okay, so first of all, thank you. So to the report, can your model accurately predict what's, what happens in this phenomenon? Uh, could you repeat? Uh, can your model accurately predict what happens in this phenomenon? Uh, yes, I can predict what happens in this phenomenon, as I show on the 
slides with comparison of conditions. Okay, opponent, what's your opinion on that? I think he had uh, all the formulas, uh, so everything can be calculated for the theoretically, and he can calculate what flow will come out at certain okay. parameters. Thank you. And also to the opponent, uh, in the discussion, you ask him to explain the Derry Weisbach, yes. um, like the theory yes. there. Do you think that uh, this explanation was accurate? Um, I still don't get where this formula comes from, so uh, uh, I, uh, he said that it was from the uh, resources, but if this uh, formula is uh, empirical, then it's not accurate because uh, um, it, it wouldn't be that correct, but if it's okay. purely theoretical, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And again to the reporter, why do you think that the immersion death is irrelevant? Since you're in your setup, you explicitly um, manage that the water level is constant. Why do you think that the immersion death is relevant? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, because I investigated and I could show the hidden slide in which I could uh, show that it's irrelevant. Uh, please connect it. Uh, Just very, very quickly. Yes, so uh, it was my, for my range, it was uh, constant. The flow was constant from the change of immersion. What was the range? Uh, this range was to 11 millimeters, and I don't use the higher because then Whirlpool creates, and we don't okay, know how to yeah, Whirlpool for Fine, thank you. Many. And to the opponent, why do you think uh, is like, uh, what do you think about the importance of the immersion death? Uh, I think it's very important. It has a uh, effect on the pressure and the equation, so it will be different flow coming out from the straw. So it is very important parameter. Okay, and to the report on how many measurement, uh, like how many measurements did you do for your data? Yes, so uh, for every point on my uh, slide, I uh, record um, a 60 seconds video and take it for uh, f five seconds parts mm -hmm. and uh, compare those five seconds parts, the difference between Okay, the and also to the, the reporter, did you vary the straw material which would highly influence the friction? Uh, different uh, different liquids? Straw, straw material. Straw materials. So, uh, for different diameters, yes or no? uh, I use different materials. Okay. And to the opponent, what do you think is the most relevant parameter? Uh, I, I think all the parameters that he has changed were uh, relevant. All the parameters that are inside the formulas are relevant, but I, I can't tell now which one may okay, have more. Okay, fine. Thank you very effect. much. Okay, thank you. We now have two minutes preparation time. Okay, so... First of all, thank you very much for the report and also thank you for the nice discussion. And this will be my review on problem number 11 for pumping straw. Let's start. So first of all, uh, to the reporter, uh, he had a working basic explanation and also a good solution for the challenges of the setup. For instance, keeping the water level, level constant. Then. Uh, the accuracy of the setup was not determined and there was an unclear error consideration and he used too much time on deriving the theory. Uh, he also neglect, neglected the immersion depth and for a high immersion depth it was not justified to a small measurement range. And concerning the, yeah, the three expressions only in literature, where, like only three, ex three expressions were found in literature uh, of the equation and he did, didn't independently measure them and it could be a possible fit parameter. And another lag was here, the consistent deviation of theory and the measurements, and it can also be seen in a video as well as in the diagrams. Moving on to the opponent. Um, like the opponent had a good task interpretation, and she also mentioned the immersion death as an important factor, and it was, a, in general, a good summary of the presentation and also mentioned the inconsistent of the theory and experiment comparison. However, the discussion of the drops coming out of the straws were, yeah, kind of irrelevant. There was a lack in her own opinions and she also missed the point by neglecting not considered the immersion test until I asked it. And the opponent thinks that the theoretical approach is accurate, but we disagree. Now, coming to the key uh, discussion points. So, first of all, the flow was discussed, and the opponent asked, "Why did the drop? Uh, why do the water? Why does the water come out as a droplet?" 
and there the reporter stated that they separate after leaving, and there we agree that the surf tension pulls the water into drops, but this phenomenon is not really relevant um, yeah, for this phenomenon here. Then the next words was the Darcy Weisbach uh, theory, and here the opponent asks what the equation states, and there the reporter describes it as a form of inner friction, and here we disagree because we think the pressure loss is due to the turbulences at the boundary layers. The next point in the discussion was uh, the disagreement from of the data and the theory, and here the opponent asks where the uh, der der derivations come from, and uh, he stated that it's due to different friction losses, and then the opponent asked for uh, the assumptions, and the, the assumption was a constant velocity, but unfortunately the opponent didn't state it her own opinion. And in his, our opinion is that in his videos, um, like we see that the straws were not fully filled, and this contradicts his, his assumption in the theoretical model. The next point was a contradiction, and the opponent asked for a justification of the, con uh, not a contradiction, of the contraction term, and there the reporter says that the water flows in and creates low pressure region. Here again, the opponent didn't have an opinion, and we think that the velocity is low in order to be, or has to be low in order to be relevant. So in general, this is the fulfillment of the task. The geometry was in fact investigated uh, very good, but like other, relevant parameters such as the pumping speed, uh, not the pumping speed, the immersion depth wasn't really considered. And yeah, thank you very much. Two, minute, two minutes for concluding remarks. You could see that for the range we were interested in, um, the flow is constant and it's not dependent on the immersion. And that's because, as it was in our um, equations, um, uh, in, in this immersion depth cause a little bit uh, pressure, in, which is hydros uh, hydrostatic pressure. And this hydrostatic pressure, because the edge is really small, it's like millimeters, it is not important. And this range, uh, which I measure uh, if it's not important, is, um, in my opinion, uh, good, because if we uh, make uh, our pump immerse uh, more, uh, it will, uh, the whirlpool will uh, take effects. And I've checked for all my measurements if the whirlpool takes effects, because uh, what is important in the whirlpool is that then um, the air is going to the straw, so it, the flow is uh, smaller. And in any of my measurements, there wasn't any whirlpool. And to um, try to make the, uh, the, the longest range of measurements, I cut this straw like that, so uh, less water is moved by this cross-sectional area of the straw. Uh, yes, I use Darcy Weisbach equation, and I don't fit it any parameters. And Darcy Weisbach equation is derived experimentally. Uh, it's for uh, tubes with, with some radius and length. And I think that uh, it's, um, it's good um, for, for this problem to use this uh, equation. Although we have the comparison from, for hagen poiseuille equation, which, which is for theory. Um, what? Yes, and the straws were uh, always full uh, for my measurements, although these oh. points which I showed. Oh. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Good, then we have like five minutes for questions from the jury. Please, opponent and reviewer to the stage and share the microphone. This one has no batteries. Yeah, Daniel. I have a question to actually all three of you. Um, do you think, or what's your opinion on, is there a maximum angle normal to this uh, water surface where this phenomenon doesn't work anymore? So, or is it dependent on other parameters? Um, we think that for a given setup there, um, for 
if only the angles change and the angular velocity and all the other parameters are kept constant, there's always a maximum angle. Okay. Um, I think that for the uh, same uh, constant velo uh, angular velocity, if we change angle, there might be some angle that uh, the flow doesn't come up. Okay. Yes, so for for higher angle, it's harder um, for water to come out because the component of uh, centrifugal force is smaller, mm -hmm. but there will be always uh, uh, such angular um, velocity for which this, uh, this component of, uh, of centrifugal force will be enough to pump the water. Uh, but there could be some situation when um, we don't have the, um, enough the, um, centrifugal force uh, because firstly this whirlpool will so occur so we could... Do you think there's a limit or uh, yes or no? Is there a limit or not on the angle? No, there is no. Okay. Jonathan and then Martin. Then. So, uh, to the reporter first, correct me if I'm wrong. You as, you, uh, one of your assumptions was that at the top of the straw there is atmospheric pressure. Is that correct? Uh, for me or for... Yeah, for you. For the, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, report. that's my assumption. Okay, now for all of you, starting with the opponent, do you think this assumption, uh, there could be a problem with that assumption? I think this assumption is valid for this problem. Okay, then the reviewer. So, I think that assumption is valid as well because ev uh, atmospheric pressure is every, like, everywhere and we have this okay. uh, shape and, and it's, it's, it's yes on no, top. It's okay, you don't need to clarify. Okay. Okay, uh, in the darcy Vosbacher uh, equation, wh where did you uh, take out uh, the, the, the numbers which you've fit in? Like, was, was it from internet or...? Uh, yes, so uh, I didn't fit any numbers. Yeah, like, uh, you feed it in, it in some way, like you used some kind of numbers, so where do, where do they come from? Uh, those, those numbers, yes. Like, if you, if you can show me the darcy Weisbacher formula? Yeah, uh, just a second, uh, because I don't remember on which slide it is, but... Okay, so, yes, as we could see, this pressure loss is dependent on the flow, and this flow, uh, the Reynolds number is dependent on the flow too. So, um, so uh, first no, but there, there is a material constant somewhere. Uh, could you repeat? There is a material constant somewhere, like the FDO. No, there is no, because th there is for the rigid, uh, rigid, uh, um, rigid uh, straw, uh, there are some constant. We don't use the constant. We assume that the straw is smooth. And we tried for, uh, we checked the material properties of plastic to check what is the roughness of the straw because it depends on the roughness. And we saw that it uh, changes really small, so we okay. don't want to fit any parameter. We, we, some, thank you. Some other questions, Morito? Yes. Um, do you think that uh, the temperature of the water has an influence if you have 10 degrees or 80 degrees? Yes, so I think that the temperature of the water affects the uh, viscosity of it, and uh, that, that's, that's important because if we have lower viscosities, this uh, loss from the drug is uh, smaller. Uh, but I think that for we, could, we, we have to change this temperature radically to, to see this uh, change in viscosity, which will be relevant. I agree that uh, parameters that uh, were um, uh, referring the material of the liquid will have been changing for the temperature, but it's hard for me to tell what temperature is needed to change significantly. S s me as well. Uh, so concerning the temperature, it, it is negligible, but if we change it a lot, it can have a little impact, but not really that relevant. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're out of time and we'll proceed to grading. Okay, I think everyone finished grading, if I'm correct. Perfect. So then we just have short uh, clarification about the grades, first on Martin on the report. Uh, 
Uh, okay, yeah, I was really puzzled uh, when Paul came saying that I'm the lowest one because that's, that's probably <laughs> uh, means you were very good on it. But if I would have to criticize, then I, I would say that um, you should not stop on, on, on being happy with that uh, discrepancy between theory and experiment. Like, I, I saw... I saw a different solution of this problem, and like people came up with solutions which which managed to cover this difference. Maybe with a fitting parameter, maybe with some more elaborated theory, maybe with something else. But like um, staying there, that I have like this big discrepancy in many of the actually most of the points of the of the, of the theory and experiment. This is a, this is a major failure. We could speak about other other minor stuff, but I think it was it was a nice report. Uh, all in all. Thank you very much. And then we had Martin, high end. Yes, uh, congratulations from my side. I really liked uh, your report. I think you did a great job um, for a long time separating theory and experiment to, to try to include step by step into the theory all the necessary parts so you didn't fall into the trap to make a rough fit and say, yeah, it's okay. And you actually saw that there are many uh, there's a lot of physics going into, which many teams didn't consider in this problem, for example. And I think yeah, I had the impression you really understood what you do, so, yeah. Um, thank you. Then we have for opposition, Jonathan, on the lower end. I will, I think um, the, the biggest improvement opportunity that you have is to, to pull through on your good points that you have, especially in the discussion. I feel like you had a, a lot of um, good points in your presentation and, and also like prepared and also started speaking about them in your discussion. But then for me personally, these went nowhere. Like they, they kind of fall, fell flat. And I, I, I always was waiting for this resolution where we, okay, we, dis we agree on, on this and this, or we disagree on this and this or something. But I felt like there was always like this, okay, no, let's just move on to the next topic. I think maybe, uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest uh, improvement point. Okay, thank you. Then on the other end of the table and grading spectrum, we have Marcus. Okay, so um, I thought your questions were superb. Um, I thought they were pertinent, they were really good. Um, I thought your report was accurate. We can discuss about the formulas and the complicated formulas. Okay, it's complicated because it's fluid dynamics. Um, uh, I, in the discussion, that's the only point really where I have a little bit, I thought um, the droplet thing, I think I disagree with pretty much everyone probably here that the droplet thing is what's important to clarify because in the critical region that does matter. And I think that's the, probably the point where this point of contention you did address. Um, the Darcy Weisbach thing, okay, there was a bit of confusion. It was important to clear up. Um, the one thing I do, say, you, you asked about the assumptions, then he stayed and I said, okay, and then are they valid? So, so it was, we didn't actually get a discussion at this point going. That was the only thing where I deducted some points, but overall, very good effort. Thank you very much. Then for review, we had Maurizio on the lower end. Okay. Um, the review was okay, but I think uh, uh, one could have pointed some uh, some aspects, uh, uh, the positive and the negative aspects, in, in a more um, deeper way or more consistent way. Uh, let's say dealing with uh, with the strong and the weak points in a more quantitative way, not just qualitative, but showing what is correct or let's say what is a good assumption or a good result and what is something which is, could be improved, yes. Thank you. And then we had Christian Treichert. Yeah, in my opinion, it was a really um, well done review. Um, asking questions, uh, also uh, pointing out uh, relevant points that might have been addressed by the, both the others. So altogether, I think it was really the, the, a great fight, and it was really the fight that should have been at the end the, the highlight. Yeah. Thank you very much for these um, words. So 
Also from my side, thank you all for participating. I think all of the three teams did an absolute marvelous job. So a big round of applause to our finalists. And with this, we're almost at the end of this year's AYPT. So first, I would like to ask everyone, um, especially the team members, to help um, Elias, who will lead the restructuring of the room and like, please tell you to move tables, everyone else, in discussions. And then we'll have the closing ceremony right after that. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe I start um, thanking all of you for coming here, thanking for the great performance, um, the teams, the team leaders, the supervisors, the organizational committee. I also should thank our university again. Um, I really, uh, yeah, I would state on behalf of the Austrian Physical Society, where we really uh, have an effort on promoting physics among the youth, among the young students, the high school students, because you are our future. And um, this time I think I was really impressed that we have a good way to what it should be, the fraction between female and male participants, so we had about 40% uh, ladies and 60% uh, men, and we are uh, having, we had fights with 50-50. Uh, I would like to point out that the European Physical Society this year issued a calendar with ladies from, yeah, uh, all over the world working in Europe in physics, uh, also back to Lisa Meitner, back to the Nobel Prize winners Maria Göppert, who was Ma Maria Göppert Meyer, who was the second, and uh, uh, up to the most recent uh, female uh, Nobel laureate in physics, Anne Luyer. Um, so I'm really happy that among you, among the participants, there might be the one of the future Nobel Prize winners. I wish you all uh, that you with uh, a lot of new experiences, with new friends, travel home and hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Since this year everything is happening very quickly, we need a quick technical delay of about two minutes. There he comes. So, we've just now received word of who has won the competition. For you, it will still be a few minutes until you will know. Um, just making the last signing the documents. But first, let me like really express my deepest gratitude towards everyone who has made this event possible. First of all, to Montana University Leoben for letting us be here in these rooms. Big round of applause, please. <laughs> Second, to all of our other sponsors, like the Austrian Physical Society, who is also represented with the president, Christian Teichert, um, who makes this event financially possible. Please, 
Big round of applause. But of course, we also need like people who make sure that the clock is ticking, who make sure that all of the tables are relocated into the right room, who check that everything is on schedule. Big round of applause for all of the organizers. And another special round of applause for Gerhard Haas, who is still signing documents and doing all the local organization. <laughs> then we have all of the jurors who decide who, um, who decide on the grades. And there would be like no competition without jurors. So big round of applause to everyone who spent their free time being here. And then, last but not least, this whole competition would not exist without you, the students, and the team leaders who guide you through your presentations, spend countless nights and hours refining slides, measuring experiments, fitting parameters, building theories. I think every one of you has briefed over these last few days that you have what it takes to compete in this competition, to be on a good path, and I hope that many of you will continue on studying natural sciences, maybe even physics, maybe some of you will be here at Montana University of Leoben, and I hope to see many of you in next year or along some other path. Thank you for being here. So, with all that out of the way, I think we can finally come to the closing ceremony and like um, congratulating all of the teams. Team Innsbruck, Unfortunately, already needed to leave, but still made a um, very good impression with like 86.1 points. Big round of applause. <laughs> Next up was Team of Slovenia with 94.2 points. Please come to the stage. Oh, next up is Team of Greece with close 95.6 points. Okay, next team, Simon, can you please? So that we, we're a bit faster. Next up is Slovak East with 102.4 points. Big round of applause. And 
for the next teams, then also please the team leaders come to the stage. We also have certificates for them. Okay, next team is Team Vienna with 106.9 points. It seems that they unfortunately already needed to leave. So we'll go to the next team of Team Donaustadt Vienna, 107.8 teams at uh, points. Since they're also already on their way, we now have the first team with the bronze medal, Team Switzerland, 111.4 points. Okay, thank you. Now, next up is Team Slovak West with 112 points in the bronze medal. Thank you. Um, next, we have with a astonishing 119.8 points the team of Sweden. Thank you. So now we have, with 125.1 teams, the team Hungary. Okay, thank you. And now we have the first team that made it to the final, who made second place and third place in the, in the final. It is the team of Georgia. And it's been an extremely close final this year with everyone could have taken it. So now we will reveal who made the second place and second prize was the team of Germany, GYPT. Yeah, 
Dankeschön. Laura, kennst du Job auch zu machen? Das war ein ganz tolles, ein ganz toller Report. Congratulations. Thank you. So, um, with this, the finalist is already decided. It will be the team Poland. One. This is here. Uh, I'm the only one, so I probably could. So then you get the one. And of course, please. Yeah. Please. Congratulations. So that was really great, and I hope that you also have in the IYPT a lot of success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, also from my side. Let's go one step down. Last time. Okay, let's have one more round of applause for all of the participants. <laughs> and with this, it's been a marvelous three days, but it's already again over. I hope to see as many of you again next year. And with this, there's only one thing for me left to say. Safe travels, and I hereby officially declare the 26th AYPT as closed. <laughs>